speaking with uh, myself, Shauna, and Stephanie today. Cool. Hi, Mark. Hello. <laughs> and uh, we just finished the intro. We'll probably black this part out for editing, but um, I, I just wanted to kind of put voices together with, with names so that you knew who you were talking to, and then uh, give it a second, and we'll... we'll just roll into some interesting flat earth stuff sound good <laughs> sounds great all right so mark you actually were the first interview that i was able to conduct with tha talks in may of 2015 um, this was when i first became aware of the flat earth clues series that you had done and mm -hmm. i think you were all over the internet maybe you can tell us a um, short description of how you got started, I, I think that the story from two years ago can be found pretty much anywhere if people Google your name. Yeah. But I'd like to kind of give people a cliff notes and then from there, what what you've been doing since, since we last spoke. Sure, uh, cliff notes of how we got to where we are today. Uh, two years ago, well, actually summer of 2014, I was a pretty hardcore conspiracy guy, but thought I'd pretty much seen it all and was just kind of bored with conspiracies and decided to look at the last book on the shelf, which nobody wants to look at. We all know it's there. It's called Flat Earth. Everyone knows it's ridiculous and stupid, and, and, and it's the movie. It's the DVD you never want to watch. You, you see it on the shelf all the time. You're never going to watch it. And I happened to take a look at it, and it turned into a Pandora's box where I thought I could knock this thing out in a weekend like everybody else does. It, you know, the, the t one of the t-shirts for the Flat Earth community is, I became a Flat Earther because I tried to debunk Flat Earth. And the more strings I pulled on, the, the more things started to unravel until February of 2015. I woke up in the middle of the night, had one of those Jerry Maguire moments where I said, okay, I'm going to go a completely different direction with this, and I'm going to see how somebody else could prove the globe. And I made a series of videos, short little videos. I, I wasn't you know, a big force on YouTube at, at the time, and made a, a series of videos called Flat Earth Clues, which was especially parts 1 through 11, and said, okay, tell me, internet, hive mind, tell me how you know it's a globe and thought for sure you know it was mostly for peace of mind it was a thought experiment more than anything i mean i was pretty convinced you know, like like anyone like you, you you take a test and you're pretty sure you've aced it but you're not positive you think that maybe you screwed something else something wrong and i was hoping that somebody would call me you know an academic somebody from university some some astronomer astrophysicist engineer something Nobody did. And as a matter of fact, the, quite the opposite happened, where subject matter experts started calling me. And people like you started, I mean, I've done, this is my 110th, I think, interview since this whole journey began. And people started crawling out of the woodwork. It, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, structural engineers, uh, air traffic controllers, pilots of, of all different types, people that specialized in long range weaponry, you name it. And they all said the same thing. They said, you know what? you may be onto something there and everything became unsolicited you know i, I didn't want to do this i i, I didn't want to do flat earth this is the last thing i or anybody in the community wanted to do and so then uh you know a place out in london called me he said hey i'd like to turn your clues into a book okay another guy called me hey i want, want to do some apps let's let's do some websites okay and then the next thing you know you know here i am uh, 500 videos later and the community has grown to where, and I'll tell you what, what I've been doing recently in a sec, but the community has grown to where back when I started this, if you typed in flat earth into the search engine, sorted by upload date, maybe you'd get, I don't know, 50,000 hits, relevant search, search results. You type that same thing in today and it's up to 16, almost 17 million which is insanity and one of the side effects of the community that, we, that has grown to an immense size now is that if you like type in the earth is into any search engine it's probably going to say the earth is flat or type in is the just those two words and the question will come up is the earth flat you know, we didn't even try to do that we did that with no marketing money <clears throat> so anyway but since then it's really uh it's really gotten to a point where uh it's it's surreal the question which used to be ridiculous now has been turned into something 
I'm not going to say a cult, but more of a, a, a really a grassroots community which has a life of its own to where mainstream, and we can talk about this as we, as we go on, mainstream has latched onto it over the last six months, and it's, and it's been a fantastic ride so far. So how's that for an opener? <laughs> that is great. I think that gives us a, a little bit of an idea. Um, we actually have a resident astrologer with us, with Stephanie James, and um, I would like to see what you know her thoughts are as as it relates to uh, the flat Earth relates to to the planetary effects. I mean, if oh, but can I can I is... can I throw one more chime in there? If it, mm -hmm. since 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 we are talking a little bit about astrology, because people have said, doesn't this kill astrology? I go, no. No, not at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. The, the the nothing nothing changes when it comes to astrology, as far as you know the layman's concerned. Uh, the stars are still out there. It's it's a giant elaborate system of clockwork, uh, which which tells a lot of different things. The only difference is is that the stars aren't an unbelievably incomprehensible number of miles away. They're just in your backyard. They're they're still up there. It's, but they're your stars. They're nobody else's. That's my take. Interesting. It is interesting. I do. I do have a few questions, actually. I um, would imagine you would. <laughs> well, I mean, um, immediately, you know, I, I was um, I was watching a graphic about um, the flat Earth on YouTube earlier. I think um, I was uh, I was w listening to a show that um, you'd um, had a, a, a heated kind of heated debate with a, a scientist um, on another show, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, while, while I was watching this graphic, I started to think to myself, where does the zodiacal belt come into this? Because it's obviously, um, you know, it's it's the, a projected um, sort of line of movement that we, you know, our, I think it's our equator goes through. Yes. And um, uh, as I was watching it, I was thinking, so if we don't have an equator, how do we have a zodiacal belt? Excellent point. And for me, and, and some, some, you know, the, the flat earth community does disagree on a few things, but for mm. me, it's, it's rather easy, meaning because I, I subscribe to the planetarium version. So okay. we are in a giant, uh, and I, you know, this kind of, kind of dates me when I say, oh, yeah, I've been to a planetarium, lots of younger people say, what the heck is that? <laughs> um, but a, a, a dome-like structure, if you, a planetarium is a building where you go and it's like a sports stadium, but yeah. the seats point yeah. straight up and they simulate the, the sky. And yeah. the, the difference between a normal planetarium and what I think this is, is that a normal planetarium only has one projection system because it's small enough. You can you can get away with mm. it because you don't have the, the one person on one side of the planetarium and one person on the other side. They're seeing the exact same stars. But if yeah. this place is as big as I think it is, you know, Truman, Truman show to the nth power. Big. I was so, going to say that the Truman show. Oh, yeah. yeah. The, that movie really resonated with me. Uh, 1998. 1998 Jim Carrey one of his best yeah the, then if, if the place is as big as I think it is then you have multiple projection systems and you're saying well how mm. would that work and I say okay you got one guy in the northern hemisphere one guy in the southern hemisphere on a flat world that'd be kind of like inner and outer rings both mm. of them both of them are on cell phone with each other it says hey I can see the belt of Orion the other guy says oh yeah I can see the belt of Orion too and he goes but the middle star is blue and he goes that's weird because mine it's green now you'd think both these guys think they're looking at the exact same star system but in a system that big they don't have to be they can be looking at the they're looking at two different instances of the same stars if for for lack of a better term you're looking at you're looking at two separate projections because human beings can only be in one place at one time and yeah. that's that's how you would pull it off i know it seems like a little bit of a cop out but it it works quite well Again, you know, if a planetarium was that big, you'd have to do that also. And I, I know what you're talking about, the, the, the time-lapse photography at the equator where one, you know, one set of stars goes clockwise, the other goes counterclockwise. And I absolutely do believe in that. Uh, the thing I don't believe in, and I'm not trying to cut you off, is of course not. that uh, the Coriolis effect where the water drains in different, in different uh, hemispheres, I don't, yeah. I don't believe that's nearly what people think it is. Uh, there's a fantastic video out there by a non-flat earther, a real scientific guy, uh, YouTuber called uh, Smarter Every Day. He's got, I don't know, 5 million subscribers. And he did a fantastic simultaneous test, northern and southern hemisphere, with freestanding pools of water. And he goes, I, he goes, I don't know what they're talking about as far as you know, toilets flushing in one direction and, and mm. the other direction. He goes, he goes, it has nothing to do with the spin of the Earth. So anyway interesting so what so what does that have to do with then because I, I just how does how does that happen you mean that's the, the water 
Yeah. Oh, it doesn't. Like, that was the weird part. He I... he took two kitty wedding pools. One was in the southern hemisphere. One was down in Australia, and it was a, it was a beautiful scientific experiment where yeah. uh, he the the kitty the kitty pools were filled up to the brim, and mm. they was done simultaneously, literally in the exact same time. They were on video phones with each other, and they were recording on the video cameras. Let the water sit for hours so it was perfectly still, and then to make sure the water was not disturbed. They took eyedroppers of color, food coloring and made kind of like a cross pattern on this thing and had a central yeah. drain plug, pulled the plugs at the exact same time. And the the motion was so, so gradual that it was almost undetectable as far as the, the spin was involved. He goes, right. he goes, he goes, and they repeated it. They did it several times. And he goes so much so that he goes, he goes that what you're seeing in, in sinks and toilets he goes it's got to be because of how the water is going into the bowl for whatever mm -hmm. reason he goes it does he goes it does not exist but i'll take it one step further and i know i, I get kind of excited and i, I ramble a little bit. but <laughs> but in the meantime since i've been talking you know since the first has it been that long by the way shauna Seriously? it'll be two years in may yeah oh, <laughs> smokes time flies I've been talking to subject matter experts, the the people that have called me from all the, the branches of the military forces. And initially, I just wanted to get a sniper on you because you hear mainstream television say, well, you know, if the sniper shoots long enough, they have to account for the, the, the spinning of the earth. That's not true. I've talked to tank commanders, artillery guys, missile guys that, you know, they're shooting 20, 30, 50, 60 miles, submarine guys that are shooting torpedoes at 30 miles. He goes, and they all say the same thing, which is the firing solution never takes into account, ever takes into account the spinning of the earth. Now, that doesn't mean that they haven't heard of it, but they never use it. And, and so when I see a guy on mainstream television come on and say, oh, yeah, I shot 1,600 yards and I had to account for the, uh, the spin of the earth going, really? Because I got a guy next to me that shot 30 miles and he never had to do it. And he did it over and over and over again. And that makes sense because the... Um, if, if you're shooting 30, 50 miles, when if you were like, say you're shooting a cannon, not only would you have to know elevation and windage, but you'd also have to know two other very, very important things. One is, okay, which way are you facing on the map, northwest, southeast? And where are you on the map? Because the, the spinning of the earth, if you believe mainstream science, is a thousand miles at the equator, a thousand miles an hour at the equator, but it's zero miles an hour at the North Pole. And then you've got this scale, this sliding scale, between zero and a thousand miles an hour. And you'd have to take all these things into effect if you're shooting long ranges. He goes, it goes, never happens. The, the charts exist, but he goes, no one ever uses them. It was, fan it was an amazing thing. And that was just something I found out. It had nothing to do with my clues. There was just the, the things that people would offer up. Anyway. Um, so I, I would really like to ask a couple more questions sure, about that. Sure, sure. Space. Sean, by, by the way, <laughs> Shauna, did you just blindside her with this? I. <laughs> I did actually. We were we were talking for about twenty minutes, getting ready for a show that we had scheduled um, for today, and then we were waiting on this guest to show up, and hadn't heard anything, hadn't heard anything, and I sent him a message, and he said, "I'm I'm really sorry, I have to reschedule." I said, "Well, I see Mark's green," <laughs> and we'd already talked about Thanks. about having you on um, around. Uh, at some point in May so that yeah. we had a little bit more time to kind of go through and gotcha. and figure out what we were going to discuss. But I was like, well, if he's game, let's just do this now. <laughs> uh, you, 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 uh, and I apologize in, in advance. Uh, St Stephanie, is it right? That's right. Yeah. yeah Stephanie, I, I apologize. You know, the, when, when somebody hears it for the first time or if they really haven't been into it, it's in a real, it's a real, I mean, women actually react better than men do. They're, they're more open-minded when it comes to things, but I mean, it's, it can be a real affront to your senses because people is like, what are you talking about? I've seen, we all know, uh, let me give you a quote real quick before you ask your questions. Mm. This, this will kind of size up things where I, and I put this in the description of every video I do now, which is George Orwell, you know, the famous author of 1984. Of course. He yeah. wrote back in 1946 an article for the Tribune. It had nothing, it wasn't, it was a, kind of a thing on science, how science has this massive responsibility and sometimes it takes liberties. And he goes, he goes, it's interesting. He goes, you could go to anybody on the street right now and ask them, how do you know you're on a globe? And the first response is always going to be the same. The first response is, is this knee jerk reaction. Well, pff, why are you even asking me that? We know we're on a globe, all right? 
Come on. Everybody knows that. And then if you press them on it, they start to get angry. And I thought that was very interesting because in 1946, that was 12 years before NASA. So if we had no space programs at all, how did everybody know we were on a globe? It wasn't because the space program came along and in 1972 finally showed you a picture. It was because you were told that science told you it was a globe, that plain and simple. They put the globe in your classroom and they said, that's where you live. And they do that yeah. over and over, you know, for the first 12 years of your, I'm sorry, the first 12 years of your schooling, depending on where you go. And, yeah. you, and you take it, you take it as, as, as gospel. And I compare it to, and I'll end with this. I, I compare it to things that you can test every day. We all know water is wet, fire burns, you drop something, it falls to the floor. That appears to be some form of gravity. But when it comes to the shape of the earth, that's something that everybody goes on faith. And they, it was absolutely faith up until 1972 when finally the, the Americans showed a picture and said, oh yeah, but that's, where, that's where you are, by the way. Well, actually at school, not only do they tell you that you live on a globe, but they actually laugh and ridicule people who actually thought that the earth ever was flat. That's yes. something that's part of the education system. We all sit there and go, oh, how stupid is that? Or what did you sail a boat and you come to the edge of the earth and you're going to fall off and where are you going to go? Okay. That sort of thing. And so you'd sit there and go, oh, that's just really ridiculous. Of course, how could that ever be true? Yeah. But they're not giving any credit towards the fact that there might be a very plausible way for it to happen. Yeah. Um, I'm open-minded to anything. Um, I like to hear what people have to say, and I'm I'm I, I'm happy to change my mind if uh, I hear a good enough explanation for something, and I can back it up with some research. It, it's, um, it's it's a long it's a weird journey. If you if you and and I will warn you in advance. If you <laughs> like your life the way it is, if you get up in the morning, it's like yeah, you know things are pretty good. If you can do that on a daily basis, don't look in. Do not open Pandora's box when it comes to this, because this will uh, me this will mess you up. Because once you get that far, because once you open the box, you can't put it back in. I mean, the, the genie can't, yeah. will not go back in the bottle. And I've heard this time, I had so many emails from people that said, oh yeah, for two weeks, I basically didn't sleep. I was just absorbing tons and tons of video material and then, you know, doing their own research. And when they came out the other side of whatever tunnel it was they created, they realized, because it makes you reevaluate everything else you've, mm -hmm. ever, you've ever been told and uh it, it's it's rough and and it what's great about it so far is that we we have a mass a very extremely um unusual higher retention rate when it comes to this like 99.9 .9 percent people to get into this stay in it they uh yeah. I've, I've never seen something like this i mean yeah if you're an astrophysicist or an astronomer or you or you have your master's degree in any of the physical sciences there's no way there's no, there's nothing you can do because you're you're not going to be able to come back from that uh you know you've had too much education and your mind is just not going to be able to, to go down that route but what we've yeah. done is over a series of things and you can ask whatever you want what we've done is we've created if you treat it like a court case which i really have been over the last year anyway uh it's not that it is any do any one of the one of the things that I lay out or anybody else lays out in the community do do any one of those things prove flat earth no they absolutely do not do they create reasonable doubt in the globe yeah they do that all day long six days a week and twice on Sundays and the 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 scientists have only have a limited number of weapons to or tools in the box to go against us and they've been having a devil of a time recently and uh, to the point where now mainstream well i mean we'll, we can get into this how, I don't, how much time do we got by the way um i think we're doing um uh, uh 45 minute segments oh, okay then I, I i probably shouldn't ramble as much as i'm doing <laughs> so but it's actually it's... i would leave that up to to stephanie because she's the latest she's five hours ahead of, okay. of me in detroit so We'll, we'll splice this out. I don't know, Stephanie, as long as you're willing to go, we can splice that, this I'm, into a couple of shows. Okay, I'm, let's I'm, just see how we go then. That, no, that's yeah. fine. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm easy. I'm on West Coast, uh, Los Angeles time. So it's only three here. I can, I can go as long as you want. But it's been, let me put it this way. Science has, what, what we've basically done is we've created a court case to where it's not, it's not that we're anti-science, by the way. It, it's not the old flat earther thing where it's like, you know, science, we should go back to the mid 1800s and, you know, burn all the science books. You know, I, <laughs> I love science, you know, light bulbs, microwave ovens, air conditioning, pay hey, super handy, all those things. But yeah. science team seems to take leaps of faith and then they claim they don't. 
And when it comes to this, mm -hmm. the, this is the uh, let me let me throw this one more thing out at you, and then I'm sure you've got questions, which is this. I put the I put the hypothesis out there, and I say, look, forget about you no know, the the scientists that work on weapons and work for the military. I go, let's just think about mainstream scientists. If they ran into a theory, something that was out there that went against science, and it was big enough, would they tell the general public? Would they, or what, you know, because you know, you're going against science. It's the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie scenario, and mm -hmm. that is the Ark of the Covenant. You know, the Americans got it at the end, and you know, after that whole big song and dance movie, what happened to it? They put it in a crate, they put it in a warehouse, and no one ever got to see it ever, ever, because it's unexplainable. Science can't explain it. And if you can't explain it, they are going to bury it, they are going to re repress it. And this is one of those things. Let's say that the scientists, scientific community, once they had the tools in the 1950s and they went up high enough, because seriously, until, yeah, you can be 99% sure with sticks and shadows and curved shadows on the moon and whatever you, whatever you want to use before you have a space program, you don't know until you get high enough and actually look back and say, oh, that's what the earth looks like. When you got high enough and you looked back and it didn't look like what it looked like, what you thought it was going to look like, mm -hmm. you know, the classroom globes. Would you come back down and say that it was this whatever shape it is? I highly disagree. You know, th think that silence science would 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 keep their mouth shut and, and not say it and hold on to it as long as they could. Uh, well, anyway. that's because if you have a, a, a different opinion to any other kind of uh, mainstream science, you're often ridiculed before. Um, you're you know taken yes. seriously and that happens that, that that's you know I was going to speak to you about uh, you know the heliocentric model of the solar system sure. compared to the geocentric mm -hmm. model of the solar system purely because um, obviously uh, astrology and astronomy were both uh, what, well, a combined subject um, many many years ago until they realized that you know the sun was actually the center of our solar system rather than the earth. So for yep. a long time, we thought the earth, uh, the, the solar system revolved around us. Yep. Um, but does this put, does this flat earth theory then put us back into the center of the solar system again? Yes. It, well, it puts us back in the center of everything. Um, it yeah. is, it is purely uh, the, the geocentric model. In fact, it's geocentric to, 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 to the nth power, which is, we are the center of everything. Everything, everything revolves around us. The stars revolve mm. around us, the sun and the moon. Now, I don't necessarily think they're projections. I think they're actually physical objects. Uh, most of this, the, the Flat Earth community that I've run into think that the sun and the moon are like um, a mobile spinning above a child's crib. Kind of like the, okay. you, take, you know what, it's, what it really looks like is the yin yang symbol. Where yeah. you know, the, if you put you lay the yin yang symbol on top of the flat Earth model, it fits really really well. Where mm. yeah, the sun is a directional light source, the moon is its own directional light source, and they're they're not you know the sun isn't ninety three million miles away, the moon isn't two hundred thirty seven thousand miles away. They're both I don't know less than fifty miles wide and spinning above us. They're and and since they're directional light sources, when they go off into the distance, they just go off into the distance, and you know they're light. So. Go ahead. I'm curious um, as to how you would get different moon phases because, um, you know, how how could they move to certain points? Because obviously when the sun and the moon are opposite, you've got a full moon. When the sun and the moon are 90 degrees apart, you yep. get the first and last quarter. Yep. And when the sun and the moon are in conjunction, that's when you get a new moon where you can't see the moon at all. But if we're talking flat Earth and they're, you know, in this, you know, planetarium type dome yep. Um, uh, construct that you're describing yep. where would they have the ability to have that movement Ex if you're to yeah. you, you know I, where I'm I going know, I know exactly where you're going with this because yep. uh, and and you said it you actually said it in your in your question there the, the the planetarium scenario and that is when you go to a planetarium how do you simulate things well, like waxing and waning moons how do you simulate yeah. a blood moon because in a planetarium you don't have an earth between the sun and the moon how do you how do you change it red and how mm -hmm. you do it is you just make it red, meaning the moon. And I, this is going to freak some people out who's listening, who's listening out there. But I'll give you a quick example and you guys can look this up, you know, in your free time, which is the moon is its own projection system. It isn't reflecting the sun at all. 
And by that, I mean, look up something called, uh, and this isn't necessarily directly tied to flat earth, but it's a great little experiment called cold moonlight. If you've never heard of it, it is, I've tested it myself. I've got a little $15 point and click infrared thermometer. Somebody told me at the end of 2015, they said, and it was a caller for a show that I was doing. And he said, he goes, do you know the moonlight is cold? And, I, and he hung up and my, my co-host and I, we laughed. It's like, whatever. It's like, guy's obviously on some sort of medication. And <laughs> I, and I started looking into it a little bit. I was going, wait a minute. And what they mean is that, because people say, well, everyone knows, you know, it's colder at night and it's warmer during the day. Duh. It's going, no, 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 that's not it. Meaning slay and, and I know I'm going to screw you up because I'm going to use Fahrenheit, but you'll get it. Uh, if it's 90 degrees, oh, sorry, the siren, that's my ride. The, um, <laughs> the, <laughs> The, um, I don't know who that is. The, where where so, I come from, we call that the Croydon Chorus. <laughs> the Croydon <laughs> Chorus? Anyone from Croydon will laugh at that and they will know. It's That's all you hear all the time, sirens. Sorry, nice. I'm, nice. I'm, I didn't no, mean to hijack no, you no, 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 please, are you kidding? <laughs> so I, I, used, I did tech support calls for, for 15 years and, and uh, nothing can really derail me too much. Although I derail myself like I'm doing right now. Okay, I forgot for a second. Okay, so 90 degrees in the sun, 80 degrees in the shade, right? We all know this. It's, it's yeah. cold, cooler in the shade, right? And if you take a magnifying glass to the sun, you can burn paper with it. We've all done that too, except in England where there is no sun, kind of like where I am. <laughs> so, I mean, you could, yeah, you put a magnifying glass up to the brightest spot in the clouds and it really doesn't do much where you are. No. So, but what's weird is if you go on a, and it works better if the moon is high in the sky, you take temperature readings in the moonlight versus the moon shade. And let's say it's 50 degrees in the moonlight. It's 40 degrees. I'm sorry. It's 60 degrees in the moon shade. It's warmer in the shade than it is in the light. And you think that's weird. And we get up, up, up to 13 degree Fahrenheit swings over here. You think that's weird. And I was the first one. I will take credit for this. I was the first one to suggest. Like, well, what happens if you take a magnifying glass to moonlight then? what happens mm. and we had the people did some tests and they're fantastic tests with copper plating and water it actually gets colder it actually gets colder you know moonlight is cold but magnifying moonlight is even colder and you're thinking that's not possible well it is because we can do this right now uh, our technology has reached a point where we can generate something it's called a cool laser and we can actually generate a refrigerating beam using laser that's like pretty cool. Now, what does that mean? I, mean, I know I've taken a long version to ask to answer your question. Does that mean that the Earth is flat? No, it doesn't. Does that mean? Does that put the relationship between the Sun and the Moon when it comes to reflectivity? Is that even a word? Reflectivity, reflective properties. The yeah. uh, yes, it does put that into question. And it's like, okay, then what? And and that, of course, for me, you know, I use that I use that reference just about every time I can because when people say, well, how does waxing and waning moon happen? I go, because the moon is projecting its own light source. Whatever's up there, whatever's powering the moon, is its own thing. It has, you know, it's it's its own properties. I'm not going to necessarily say it's mechanical. It could be organic. It could be a sentient life form. I don't know, but it's but it's not it's not. Um, it's not reflecting the sun and it's generating a cool, literally a cooling light. You guys can test this out yourself. Go and buy. In fact, I'll hold it in front of me. I know you can't see it. It's a point and click uh, infrared thermometer that they use for just about everything, you know, for testing engine parts and testing how when you lay down new asphalt, you know, what, what the temperature is. And it works fantastic. Yeah. Test it on something in the moonlight and test it on an identical object in the moonshade. You'll see it yourself. I've done it. It's, it's incredible. Anyway, there's your question. Well, thank you. Uh, no, it's, it's it's so interesting. You're posing every time you say something. I want to ask you a new question. Please. Um, but I, the, I the I I there's just so many. Um, <laughs> a couple of things. Um, uh, well, one of them that just popped up into my head was um you know I was thinking about the kind of the Viking flat Earth kind of perception of their yeah. their world that they had. Um, but I it made me think where why do you think it's a, a flat Earth then where what's where does the seismic activity come from? Where does lava come from out of volcanoes? Yep, yep. When, when there's an earthquake, what's what's caused the earthquake? And are we just sitting in a Petri dish somewhere in somebody's science lab? Or what's that about? I'd like to think there's a little more, uh, a little more thought into it than that. Because, I okay, a couple things. One, 
because some people have have asked me and, and I did that I did a clue on this and I, I got a little ribbing for the clue because I said look nothing in this system is organic nothing at all because they say well volcanoes are organic and I'm going no they're only organic because you can't think of a replication that we can do ourselves even though we can you know we can create molten metal and molten rock out of blast furnaces what's interesting about that and by that I mean everything about this system is is part of the is part of the uh, the process meaning the um the jet stream that, that controls the upper air currents work better mm. in a circular system not a globe and by the way i use the words uh, globe sphere ball versus round circle or whatever else you said anyway so the the uh jet stream for the upper atmosphere the underwater conveyor system for the water the magma system for the volcanoes and the tectonic process they're all there oh no no question what's interesting though and I'll, again i'll take a shot at science here which is uh, because people ask about the magma system they go what, what's below the flat earth i'm going tell me what's below a globe earth I go, you realize that, that science will tell you if it's a sphere that if you dug down to get to the center of the earth, it takes about 4,000 miles. And I don't know what that is in kilometers, but about 4,000 miles, right? And I go, mm -hmm. okay, well, how do they know that? And I go, what's the deepest hole ever drilled? 1,000 miles? 100? 10? Do you know what the deepest hole ever drilled is? It's eight miles. That's it. Really? That's the deepest hole anyone's ever drilled. But... When you open up a science book, and I mean any science book from age six to sixty, the, the you, you we all know this. We've seen the cross section of the Earth where it shows those wonderfully, you know, those wonderful colored bands going from red to orange to yellow to that bright yeah. white center, and they seem to be perfectly. Each one is about a, a, exactly a thousand miles thick. And and I've gone to scientists. I said, "How do you know this? How do you know this?" Well, we we use ground penetrating radar and seismic this and blah blah blah. I'm just going. Yeah, but you've had these maps around for a long time. So how do you know? Why isn't there a disclaimer in in the science book saying this is an artist's interpretation? And and I go, why don't you tell mm -hmm. people that it's just a guess? And in Wikipedia, to be fair, they'll say, oh yeah, we extrapolate what the what the core of the Earth looks like through 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 magma samples and this and that. There isn't a long scientific version of we have absolutely no idea. I go, then why don't you put in the science books? Why don't you put after the first eight miles or ten? I'll round it up for you. Why don't you just put a giant question mark inside the Earth? Why don't you do that? And it's because mm -hmm. science doesn't like question marks. They will no. they will say eventually they hate people asking them. They don't like speculation from the outside. So they will take their best guess. Then if they say their best guess enough times, they will say, well, it's our facts. It's absolutely a guarantee because, you know, no one else can prove them wrong. And and that's it. So the magma system for me is is definitely organic. And I also think it's very controlled because okay. it, and I also don't think this is a one off the and, and you probably be in astrology you probably believe this already which is you know we're not the first uh people to rent this apartment not by a long shot uh i think that we are i'll take a rough guess i'll say we're version seven maybe version <laughs> eight uh you know our our unbroken history unbroken mind you only goes back five thousand years and before that there's a whole bunch of questions that we need answered like i don't know who really built the pyramids are there the bosnian pyramids what about those sunken cities off japan or the sunken cities off of india or the radioactive glass in india just take your pick mm. it seems that and, and who was the versions you know who were those versions was what, what about atlantis what about the continent of mu uh, who were these guys and what versions were they when was when were all the continents the supercontinent known as pangaea what version was that? And then, of course, the ultimate question, who was the first? Who was version 1.0? And were the legends true that in the early versions, there were no sun and the moon? It was just shades of light and dark. And this place sort of got more elaborate as it went on. And, and whoever built this place seemed to get a lot more decorative. Uh, yeah. Afterward. And so anyway, sorry, I, I don't know if that helped that part of the question. Well, no, that's cool because I mean, like I said, every time you say something, I start thinking of more things to ask you. But I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm worried. I'm going too crazy here, Shana. Do you have anything to say? Oh, there are many things that we will end up discussing. I'm sure by the end of this conversation. Um, 
I just wanted to uh, correct myself. It was actually June 28th, 2015 that we oh, had good. our conversation. All right. so and that quite... was um, edition 81 of THA. And since then, um, I've seen a couple of well-known alternative media personalities having some very strong reactions to what you're saying to the yeah. point of there being um, pushback and just this this sense of you know well I'll send you to the moon kind of a thing where there's yeah. this this uh, they're very disturbed by the idea that people are listening to your theories and to you know they're following some of your work and believing it so I just yeah. I wanted to address that and see it's, how you felt about the that pushback and kind of it, the the pushback is absolutely natural meaning and, and i've joked with this with people it's like look if you don't laugh at this if you don't make fun of this if whoever's listening now if you're not if you're not rolling your eyes and saying man i wish this was a call-in show so i could give these guys a piece of my mind if you're not doing that right now then you're probably insane because everybody comes at this right away it's kind of like the uh have both of you heard of the la brea tar pits out uh, in California, United States. Uh, no, guys? I don't think I have it. Oh, sorry. So there's there's these tar pits, and they're left over from whatever prehistoric era, and they find tons and tons of bones and stuff in them. Because what happens is an animal, either prey or family member or whatever, falls in, and somebody thinks they can get them out. They fall in. Someone thinks they can get. It just goes on and on and on, and that's what happens with with the flat Earth. Everybody starts out at this thing looking i've been trying to come up with different analogies it's kind of like when you're looking at somebody playing with like a children's puzzle right sitting on a park bench and you're looking at him going this is simple why is this guy and he looks so frustrated why is he having such a hard time with it this guy's obviously an idiot well the puzzle is flat earth and, and you're going all right i can solve that give me that and you sit down with it and then you start playing with it a little bit and the more you play with it the more complex it gets it likes it starts morphing into you know a rubik's cube and then something that's way more you know, difficult than a rubik's cube and the pushback that that we're getting is because yeah we're seeing it, it comes with the growth there's so many people that have started getting into this that it's 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 a topic that's being spread around. I, I make I made s some videos out there called it's the uh, the world's guilty secret pleasure, which you know it's kind of like a it's it's kind of like a drug in some ways where it's like people like swapping conspiracy with each other. Oh yeah, JFK, oh 9-11, yeah. Well, it's like dude, dude, I got something for you right here. You know, it's like it's flat Earth. It's like keep it under your hat. <laughs> here, give you a little taste of this a little flat Earth. You know, see what see what happens because you can say you're open minded all day long. And I, I look, I fell into the same trap. You know, I, I consider myself a very open minded guy. And and but I have never seen a topic like this that becomes so polarizing. I compare it to any other topic you want. I don't care what it is. Uh, abortion, gay rights, women's rights, black rights, uh, vaccinations. Take your pick. I don't really care what it is. Yeah. The, you know, those are some hot buttons for a lot of people. This shouldn't be a hot button, right? Because it's so obviously terrible that nobody should ever believe in the right mind and that's the trick it's so it's so big that everyone ignored it you know you could nobody could see the forest for the trees and once people started you know getting into it it started spreading organically to where uh oh geez, who, and i've got a list of people in front of me i'm just looking at the list of videos i've made in the last 60 days it really took off 60 days ago, really, really took off when uh, one of the uh, major sports stars in the United States, basketball, you know, world champion uh, Kyrie Irving, came out during a podcast just before the All-Star game and said, oh, yeah, I'm totally I'm, I'm into flat earth. Yeah, it's, it's a great thing. And he lands in the middle of this big press briefing and people are just coming at him. And then more people and more people started coming out. And then, yeah, alternative news sources, you bet they're, they're going after it. Why, why wouldn't they? Uh, it, you don't, I have had so many people that have called me, it, even before interviews, people that have interviewed me and the people that choose not to interview me, they say, look, we're a little nervous about doing a show that covers this topic because we're afraid people are just gonna lo you know, lose it. Because in the comment sections, people in, in the chat logs, people say, I can't believe you're even talking about this. 
I'm never going to listen to you again. That that sort of thing. And the the Alex Jones show, a perfect example. Their producers contacted me and, and said, how can I couldn't make this up if I tried. How can we do a flat earth show without actually using the words flat earth? <laughs> I said, well, you're going to buy 10 minutes. You could pull that off. You could dance around it for about 10 minutes and then you're out of you're out of ideas. You're going to have to say the words. And they backed out and well, which is OK, because now what just last week, Alex Jones came out. Uh, it came out that uh, he went during a child custody battle. He fessed up and said, yeah, everything I've done over my career as an alternative news source was an act. Awesome. It was awesome. I, I'm glad I never subscribed to him. Anyway, sorry. Well, that's the thing about uh, polarizing topics to me. And this is something that I learned from uh, another um, experience where somebody was sharing something that everybody thought was just completely unbelievable, that there was no possibility that it was true. And the way that the interviewee explained it was, I'm putting this out to the public at large. And for those people that just throw it out, the baby with the bathwater, that's great because that halves the amount of people that I have left to then look at and say, are you capable of wrapping your mind around this this thought? Yeah. And it's not looking at, okay, are we sitting on a turtle and you know, on a flat earth with a the little- Elephants little, on little, top right, of a turtle, yeah. Right, or you know, have Alice down there just sweating away holding the whole thing down but it's it's being open to the concept that the world is not what we have been taught for so long and being open to that and and being able to entertain those ideas if nothing else now the first time that i talked with you i did maybe i'm a little bit crazy then because i was like yeah no that makes sense it totally makes sense. I can see how that works. You're, and, lu- you're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming from a more egocentric place of if we are the center of everything, if we, uh, you know, the the stars are there for us, the moon is there for us, yes. and the sun is there for us, and everything that has been created, like in the Eden theory of seven days, as you said, did the first version of our existence 1.0 have like a little bit more of a black and white screen TV experience and then they added color and then they added just like in the seven days of creation. Sure. I'm going to add this. I'm going to add that. I'll give you some trees, some animals to hang out with, you know, all of that. But that brings about the question for me of, you know, if, if the world literally revolves around me, yes. who or what put us here only two possibilities and i've talked about this since the beginning because yeah there was something i had to wrap my head around too by the time i got to clue 11 which was because i get those emails all the time it's like who did it who did it who's responsible (laughs) i go okay there's only one one of two ways you can go with this either it is a divine creation or god subcontracted out the work Either way, you're going to be closer to answering the ultimate question by solving it. Meaning, let's say some giant golden eggy spaceship thing decide to uh, land somewhere. And whoever came out, and you've got to remember, religion still controls, you know, the the big major five religions, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, make up 80% of the population. A lot of those people are going to look at the whoever comes down, whatever ship it is. I'm, I'm taking a stretch here, and and say, "Are you God?" You know that that's the first question they're going to ask. You, you built this place, right? And and they'll they'll say, "No, we're not God." The very next question will be, "Well, do you know God's phone number?" You know, <laughs> are, are you gonna? Can you can you get? Can you put us in touch with God? Have a few questions, because. And, and really, you're splitting hairs. You know, a technology that is that is advanced enough to create something like this, you know, whoever's living inside it, of course, is they're going to look at it as more of a divine thing. Now, am I saying that the firmament, I'm using a biblical term there, uh, or the dome or whatever it is, do I think it's got the handprint of God on it? I'm not going to define God here because this has changed my outlook on on that. Uh, do but does that put did this put me in a whole new level of spirituality yes it did 
Uh, I was, uh, you know, I was raised a born again Christian, you know, up in the northwest of the United States and went to vacation Bible school and youth group and all these fun things, you know, every Sunday and couldn't be happier after the Sunday was ended because, you know, the sermon seems so dry and the chorus is so boring. But and then when I went to college, I fell away from it. Like a lot of people, you get into things and it's like, oh, there's a whole other world out there because I was I grew up very, very sheltered. But once I got into this. I came back to a whole new sense of purpose, a whole new sense of significance, because science will be quick to tell you, oh yeah, Big Bang, you're a complete accident, and you're a speck on top of a speck on top of a little bigger speck in a universe that, has, that is so massive, we have to come up with numbers that you'll never understand. You're absolutely meaningless in this universe. And this changes all that. This goes the entire different way, which is, no, 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 no. You're in a built structure, you know, a planetarium slash terrarium slash uh, Hollywood backlot. A, a petri dish, yeah, I could use, you could use that, but it's a very nice petri dish. But at the same time, <laughs> that one of the next questions would be, uh, I know one of you is going to ask it, which is, well, why why would the creators do this? Why would they why would they hide the shape of the world? And I go, because we're the only species on this world that would actually object to the fence, to object to the wall. You can put a, a buffalo in the middle of a mm. beautiful wildlife preserve, a thousand, thousand, you know, square miles, square acres, whatever. And they, as long as they got water and nice grass to eat, they don't care. It's like, pff, fence, who cares about the fence? You put the same per, you know, you put 10 people in that same thing. That's all they're going to care about. Who made the fence? Why is this fence here? Who's on the other side of the fence? What, you know, what place do we have? Maybe we should sacrifice something to the fence. You know, all should bow to the fence and you can see where that goes. And that is, so you, you don't want that to happen. People have to act naturally. And that's why I think it, eventually the globe model, I don't think human beings were, were nearly creative enough to, to come up with it on their own. I think they were probably helped along, but we ran with it and science, look, they built up, a massive institution uh, from it over the last 500 years to the point where they are stronger than quite a few religions, you know, and, and they definitely have mainstreams here and have been making, you know, huge leaps. So do you think they're going to go backwards quietly into the night? Oh, no, <laughs> no, they're going to fight this tooth and nail. And uh, we've been watching some of the more high profile guys like Neil deGrasse Dyson really take a stand i mean the fact that he went on mainstream television the world's most famous astrophysicist rock star even though he looks like a cross between bill cosby and sinbad he comes <laughs> on he comes on television and you know talks for six seven minutes drops the mic says this is gravity and then flexes and walks off stage so much showmanship but it drove me nuts but the fact that he did that lets us know that we've struck a nerve with with somebody now he calls it an anti-scientist anti-intellectual movement that if left unchecked will destroy humanity but i don't agree anyway sorry i ramble no i think that the idea that any kind of study into something that is considered taboo or uncomfortable for people you're going to have a group that's going to say don't you know pay no attention to the man behind the curtain yeah. It's, it's not important you know pay attention to this because i want you to be safe and i want you to be able to live it's just like in a way you're warning the caveat of if you enjoy your life as it is don't open pandora's box yeah yeah and i, and I think oh, well i was gonna say i think that's that's a great place for us to take a break because we're really we're pushing that 45 minute mark oh. and um that way we can Take a break, take five, grab a cup of tea, and uh, come right back. Sure. Is that, you saying, are you saying that tea? Are you saying tea because she's in London? Really? Yes. <laughs> nice. I totally am. <laughs> pandering. That is pandering. <laughs> it works well for us, though, because she threw in hijack earlier, and I loved that. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I did. Nice. I will not do a British <laughs> accent. I won't do it. <laughs> So yeah, just give us uh, give me a five because I think that was a really great place sure. to pause. Um, I would love to. I'm gonna see if we can get the okay to use Leonard Cohen's "Everybody Knows" for that song in between. Oh, okay, sure. Um, Steph, are you good with that? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's Sounds good. If good. you're in, if, if if a song came to you and you're inspired, go for it. Well, because yeah, it's everybody knows that the game is rigged. 
Yeah. It, it just seems like it would be a good thing to do. And then um, maybe let me pick back up with uh, asking a question and, and just roll out from there. Yeah, sure. Does that, that work? Good. Yep, that does that does work for me. I'm going to go put some hot water in my mug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Mark, is that good for you? Give us yeah, yeah, yeah. Add. So I, I, I'm still on. I'm just We're just going to mute the mics and I'll be back in five. Yeah, sounds oh, great. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Hello. So we're just waiting on um, Mark to head back. Um, I want yeah, to sure. do a, because uh, we're assuming we're going to put a song in between there. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to just going to do the intro to roll back in. Okay. Aha. Sorry. Perfect time. Nope. Quite all right. So I'm going to do a quick um, kind of reintroduction. I'm sure you know how this rolls out because you've been on like every show out there. So. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so. All right, welcome back to the THA Hijack show. Uh, today we are speaking, wait, did I do that right? Okay. Stephanie? Yes, you did, sorry, I had I had it on <laughs> mute so I didn't want to be breathing and stuff, you know. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me try that again. And welcome back to the THA Hijack presentation. Today we're speaking with Mark Sargent on the topic of Flat Earth. Um, your host, Shauna Collins, and with me is Miss Stephanie James. Hi, everybody. Now, where we left off, uh, Mark, we were talking about the, um, the egocentric theory of how being at the center of everything and who or what puts us there is it like a, a sims game on autopilot could it be uh, an earlier version of humanity that went to the stars and came back and decided we needed to figure out what you know life is all about before we were uh, let loose on the universe hmm. and how that Truman show esque experience of being confined would then probably change the process of our evolution. Um, but as I said before, you've received a lot of, of pushback and I would say negative feedback from some of the, the more well-known um, people within the alternative community. And, and you were talking about how um, Alex Jones just put out that what he was doing was basically a farce. Yeah. Um, I, I wonder if if you have any kind of response or retort to the people that have been putting out their own uh, diatribes against the flat earth theory. The, and I do, actually. The good question. No one's ever asked me that. That's good. Which is, they obviously haven't, let me put it this way. You can't look in the box, actually look in the box and walk away from it, still making fun of it. The only thing you can really do is make fun of the box itself. And I'm talking about Pandora's box. So you can make fun of from the outside. It's like, why are you looking at that box? That box is stupid. No, I'm not, I'm not gonna look at that box. You're an idiot for looking at it. And you know, that's all you can do. That's your only defense really against flat earth right now, unless you've got, again, unless you have a master's in some sort of physical science, in which case your whole world implodes and you're not gonna let that happen out of self-preservation. <laughs> but like a per, a per example would be, oh, one of the bigger alternative guys would be Joe Rogan. That's a, that's a great one, but <clears throat> You got to remember that in the conspiracy world, he's kind of considered compromised, meaning, and, and if you don't know who Joe Rogan is out there, he was an American actor who turned into, he's done a lot of stuff. You know, he's done stand-up comedy, he's done the, the podcast stuff, he's done conspiracy stuff, but he used to be a really good conspiracy guy, and he went after the American space program. He went after Apollo big time, and he... Hey, he's got a lot of uh, conviction and a lot of lot of uh, enthusiasm, and so all things being equal in a debate, the person with the most conviction is going to come off as the winner, even though they may not have made any point. There was a slam dunk, and he was wiping out scientists left and right, saying that the moon missions. Now he couldn't tell you why the moon missions were faked, only that they were faked. And he goes, he goes, the American space program was a piece of junk, and somebody got to him. We don't know who, but uh, but he went dark for a while, and then when he came back, 
lo and behold, he got a brand new show on the Sci-Fi Network. And the very first episode was called Joe Rogan no, a, a Questions Everything. And the very first episode, he recanted every bad thing he ever said about NASA. Wouldn't mm -hmm. say why he thought that NASA was absolutely legit above board. But he, he was, oh, you know, you know, I want, to, you could almost see it in his face. It's like, okay, what'd they do? You know, they offered him either the carrot or the stick or both, usually simultaneously. And, you know, they say, you choose briefcase. If one briefcase has some money in it. The other has a gun. You choose which one. We're not going to let you keep, keep doing this. But when it comes to other people out there in the community, most are just stubborn uh, or they're afraid. They're afraid of, it's, it's weird because there's so many closet flat earthers and we, it's hard to tell, which is why I kind of compare it to Fight Club, where <laughs> the first rule of Flat Club is you do not talk about Flat Club because you don't know. I mean, the difference is, you know, with, with Fight Club, you, people would walk up to you with bruises and cuts. You could tell they were in the club, but with Flat Earth, you don't know. We're trying to come, come up with little insignias and stuff so that people can at least identify each other. Uh, but it's because you don't know this, there could there's there's celebrities out there right now we know full well that are that are flat earthers but they are never going to come well i should say never but they're having a tough time coming forward because once you step out onto that dance floor you catch you catch some hell look at some i mean kyrie irving caught a whole bunch of hell so did draymond green the guy that caught it even more than hit them though two weeks later was the um american basketball legend shaquille o'neal he comes out and says on a podcast, he goes, oh, yeah, there's flat, 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 you know, and, and he's going against, you know, his co-host and, and, and he's going, no, it's not. And he goes, yeah, it is, you know, and he held on for about five days. And then eventually one of his sponsors, I think, got a hold of him because the guy makes $20 million a year, even though he hasn't played forever in endorsements. And so they brought him on the Jimmy Kimmel show. And that was the first question they asked him. You know, it was, it looks so telegraphed. It's like, so you were joking about the flat earth, right? He's like nodding at Shaquille and, and Shaquille's, you know, backpedaling, you know, the best he could. But it's, it's, we've, it's weird. We're in this, 2017 is a weird year for us. We're in this kind of this transition where we've gotten past the, 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 okay, you don't get to talk about it in the room. You know, we're just going to laugh you out of the room stage to where people are really, they're coming after us. Science is doing what they can to come after us. Uh, you know, they, they brought, dug up Bill Nye and, and, you know, having him, he's talked about it on several different shows now. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's talked about it on several different things. Uh, alternative news people, not as many as you might think, have have attacked us. But there are some. Yeah, no no question. But the, Well, the, the reason, the impetus for that is that I heard, uh, originally I had heard uh, Caravan to Midnight, which oh, yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to tell you... <laughs> Right now, for anybody that I bring up right now, I have the utmost respect. I love these alternative media broadcasters, and it's because of them that I do what I do. Um, but I heard something from him that sounded very threatening, and I was surprised because I didn't really expect do you want me to do my impression? Uh, John B. Wells to be yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 go ahead. Yeah. John, <laughs> John, John B. Wells. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming for you, flat earthers. You know, he kind of sounds like a like like Batman after chain smoking. You yeah, know, I he, was wondering where that that kind of that came from, and then shortly thereafter, uh, I was listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. I believe it was you that called the Friday before on open lines. Uh, they were talking to a Mark about flat Earth, and he cut them off. Um, and then he later did a rant about it. Uh, oh, do you want me to? I can I can fill you in on the Jimmy Church thing because I I interviewed with Jimmy. Jimmy interviewed. Yeah, yeah. You did. Er uh, number three seventy six was the flat Earth clues that or the flat Earth. Well, I watch. I not only do I watch, but because I respect these people, I do my homework. Yeah. So when I heard at uh, during show six forty four that he during his his intro monologue he he kind of went off on the flat Earth and I thought now wait a minute. I think that's how I heard about you. Yeah. Was because of a Fade to Black show or a Coast to Coast show that I'd listened to where they were talking about Flat Earth, um, which was what got me on THA Talks in the first place. So yeah. um, I just. I... Jimmy Church was kind of a mystery to me, although he. 
what he did was he was one of the first people when he called me he w- he said right up front he goes just to let you know i'm really nervous about doing this show i'm excited but i'm nervous you know you you, you know what jimmy said oh yeah and he's like he's like i really i guess i'm really hesitant about doing the show so he does it with me and you know it went it went well the problem was is that jimmy church is one of the substitute candidates for the you know when george nori finally leaves coast to coast he, you know, he's trying to gun for that position. So, and George Norrie will not do Flat Earth. He's, it's weird. Uh, he, Joe Rogan, and Alex Jones, they've all said the same thing, which is they absolutely, it's weird. You, you can believe in any conspiracies you want, but the Apollo Moon Program, the United States Space Program, is off limits to those guys. George Norrie told me during the show, uh, and I'll send it to you if you want, I'm not allowed to put it up because they, uh, they'll copyright strike me, but the uh he <laughs> says right off the bat he goes he's just to let you know he said this on air not off air he goes i absolutely believe in the apollo program which was his way of telling me mark don't go after nasa that's like all right fine i don't need nasa you know it helps but i can go six different ways uh, to to do flat earth stuff well and- there have been conversations that they've had and jimmy's one of those people that again i have great respect for but i also feel like he's and he has said this on his own show that there have been off the record conversations he's had with people like Jim Mars and Linda Moulton Howe that that he's not able to discuss some of these elements. And I'm just wondering if there's something about the the backroom channel that makes him it, hesitant to really to uh, promote the idea of flat. Yeah, Earth. in fact, Linda, uh, from what I've heard. I haven't heard the clip yet, but well, no, I actually have heard the clip. She, there's a certain level of conspiracy people out there that think that flat Earth is literally a manufactured distraction against a psyop. Yeah, all against all other conspiracies. It's meant to make the entire conspiracy world look crazy. And my argument is, okay, one, you don't need us to make the conspiracy world look crazy. They are plenty crazy by themselves. Uh, now, it, but if it was, look, if, if it wasn't resonating with people, it wouldn't be a distraction. Look, this thing's catchy. I mean, really, really catchy and people have really been digging it. So, and what is it, what is it hurting? If anything, it makes people reevaluate all the other conspiracies even more. But yeah, Linda Moulton has absolutely thinks it's a psyop. Um, uh, Jimmy Church is leaning towards the psyop thing. If they, if they have discussions, it could be why um, Richard Hoagland, when he was supposed to debate me, he backed out on, on, I think, Dark 30 Radio, where he, he just was a no-show for the debate because it is the one it is the one conspiracy aspect that I've seen so far which does not dovetail at all into Flat Earth. It, you know, because Rich Hoagland's like, well, there's millions of people living on the moon and, and another million on Mars and blah, 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 secret space program, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, Starship and, Enterprise. And, and there his, you go. Yeah, he's been doing it for, what, 20, 30 years, so. Yeah, fantastic. But at the same time, the Flat Earth shoots that down in two seconds. It's like, fine, you have a secret space program? Even they would have taken actual pictures of the Earth instead of waiting 43 years between the uh, the first and second shots. It was, it was like, just use your secret space program. Take the, take all the pictures you need. Take all the video you need. That, in fact, it lends more. It, it kills the secret space program more than it does the real space program. But so yeah. you're saying I, I have to rewind this a little bit for the Mars aspect because this is something that we didn't we haven't touched on yet. Yeah. Um, from a planetary perspective, and I'm, I'm sure that Stephanie's going to want to jump in for this one as well. Yeah. But the the idea that um, we're supposed to be taking a space you know space vacation to Mars and to start to um, bring people out there to um, live and and work and thrive. So yeah. you're saying that you don't believe that. The, the planet itself is habitable or is it outside of our oh no house? it's way okay you go to hayden planetarium which is run by neil degrasse tyson mm-hmm. can you land a drone forget about a spaceship can you land a little drone on mars in a hayden planetarium no you can't because it's just a, a, a point Projection. of it, well, it's a point of light. Now, whether it's a real point of light, you know, like a three-dimensional living entity. I mean, there's a lot of people that think that the, that the stars are the luminaries. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and that fits fine with the flat Earth model. It's like, fine, they could be the luminaries. I mean, you know, they, the, only di- the only difference is distance. So, no, 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 no. Mars is just a different point of light. But now, does that mean it isn't a, a different, you know, body? No, no, no. I, again, astrology, I 
fully, you know, it, it's fully intact in, in the, the flat Earth model. The only difference are the distances. So it's not billions and billions of miles away. It's only thousands of miles away. But the um, but no, you can't land anything on Mars. And, and again, for people that don't know what I'm talking about, if we're, if we're coming in and they didn't listen to the first episode or however you're doing this, the um, uh, you got to give up the entire space program. I'm not just saying that the American space program is fake and JAXA and Europeans and the 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 um, uh, Indian and, and the Chinese. I'm not saying that they're, they're just fake. I'm saying the entire reason NASA was created in the first place is because they, they figured out where the edge was in 1956 and they freaked out. And it's like, okay, we, we got to do, we got to seal this sucker off like right now. And so 1958, NASA was founded. They militarized the sky. And in 1959, the Antarctic Treaty was formed and Antarctica, otherwise known as the Outer Ring, has been locked down forever. I mean, literally ironclad, no countries till 2041. It's not even going to be updated until then. Nobody ever does anything out there. I mean, it's a, it's to those both those moves. Well, that and the Van Allen radiation belt was announced in 1959. Those were done in the same year, and it's and that was one of those things when I looked into this, it it struck me as okay, that's what I would do. I try to put myself in their shoes, you know, in the powers that be. Uh, you name them whatever you want. But if I can relate to it, yeah. I, mean, I said, yeah, exactly what I would do. And they, they held on to it. So anyway, sorry, go ahead. So the um, fear-mongering from asteroids hitting Earth and, oh, and destroying all of life as we know it. Tell me, oh, because I get this question literally every couple of days in my email, which is meteors. And so how do you explain meteors? I'm going, okay, fine. So the planetariums can account for comets and waxing and waning moons we do all that stuff in the in planetarium but we can't do meteors fine tell me about uh, if there's thousands and thousands of satellites up there tell me a couple things about meteors one if you if, if you want to say that law of probability says that they're not going to hit a population center over the last five thousand years fine i'll give you that fine but tell me why no satellite has ever been smacked by a uh mm -hmm. A meteor spun out of control, hit other satellites. You got to remember, we just did the the movie Gravity with Sandra Bullock and and George Clooney. That was the entire premise of the movie. Was this? Spoiler satellite... alert. <laughs> oh yeah. Well yeah. Sorry. Well no. I mean it's in the first ten minutes of the movie. You know they're I sitting there. I haven't seen it. That's why I'm, I'm there. Oh okay. Well the the I'm entire talking. premise of the movie is there. That that is the whole concept of the movie, which is they're working peacefully. Uh, you know on the on their space station on on some something. And a satellite goes out of control, knocks into other satellites, and then it turns into this cascade effect where this all this very, very jagged metal is traveling a thousands of miles an hour, and it, and it runs into them, and then it's a fight to stay alive. But mm -hmm. there's the problem. That's never happened. And you'd think with all the meteors, in fact, we have, what, yearly meteor showers? I think the, um, the Perseus meteor shower is, a, is like a yearly thing. Why, not only do not satellites... Or, that's good English. Why do satellites not get hit? But they also don't ever, you don't ever see anyone saying, get out of the way. You know, satellites aren't retasked to move out of the way of meteors. Law of probability says one of these satellites, if not just one, a whole bunch would have gotten tagged by now. Again, remember, it doesn't have to be a big meteor. It can be the size of a nickel. And th that satellite's useless. Not to mention the ISS footage. You know, what those guys, again, I'm going off on a little tear here. The International Space Station, a, me a micrometeor the size of a nickel could take those guys out in two seconds. Punches through the hole, that's it. They are done. Because, oh, I don't know, th when they're inside the, the ISS, all they do is wearing khakis and polo shirts and socks. That's all they wear. You never see them in a space suit doing an emergency drill. You know, you never see them going out of an airlock. It's, uh, it's they're, where are the doors? They're, they should so have sub. Sorry. I ahead. just have to ask. You know um, that guy that's um, currently on a space station. I mean, is there? I mean, in space, do you, do we still have the, the whole effect of like, um, you know, and like no gravity and that sort of thing? Is that is that still relevant with the with the flat Earth theory? Like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Now that you still can... works. That's oh yeah, yeah. But well, you can sim. You can sim. One of two things is happening. Either they found, and I really go with the with the, the the first version, which is there's there's nobody living up there because the the in, the inner production, mm. the interior work. Not to mention, okay, well, two things. One was in the clues, one isn't. The first one is never in the history of space travel have we ever seen this. And I don't care what program: Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Soyuz, the Moon, uh, 
the, the ISS, we've never seen an astronaut with the camera running exterior outside of the spacecraft turn 180 degrees or further with the camera running. It's never, ever happened, right? That's, that's one. That, that, that very thought should just make everyone just go, hmm, what the heck's happening there? But the interior shots are horrible. They're produced so terribly. Look up. If you get a chance, I'll make it easier for you guys. Type in uh, Flat Earth or, I, you know, just type in ISS Hairspray. Look that up if you get a chance. Oh, my Lord. The women, what they figured out was we've got to figure out a way to simulate zero G or in, in some or extend the zero G thing because you can simulate it. We, we have them over here in the States. They're called vomit comets. They use them to train supposed <laughs> yeah. astronauts, right? So you go up, you, you go a steep climb, and then basically you're nosing down faster than you would free fall or about the same speed as free fall. And that gives you, I don't know, about a minute of zero G you know, pure zero G and you can do it in the atmosphere and then you just do it over and over again. And so you have like red light, green light, and, and they can tell them when to do it. Well, if you take a big enough plane and you make it look like the inside of the ISS, you just, and you can fi film zero G. That's, that's not a big deal, but to extend it, they had to use a couple Hollywood tricks. And one of them was just atrocious, which was they had to, they, because women's hair, especially you have long hair, of course, why would you ever have long hair on a space station anyway? It would gunk up the filters. You would, everyone's heads would be shaved. No one would ever have long hair, but they don't seem to care. That's saying we'll, we'll let them have long hair. And when they did this, one of three things, because here's the problem. When you're doing a zero-G plane, because we still can't visually see turbulence, a woman, if she's moving, if you have long hair and you're moving, your hair is going to accentuate the movement and, of course, the, the, you know, the sideways movement of the turbulence. And you're not going to be able to, to show that because there is no turbulence up in, in space, if you believe in space. So what they did was, uh, out of all the options, like, okay, I don't know, put her hair back in a ponytail. That's first option. Uh, put on a nice, uh, jazzy NASA cap. That's the second option. But no, what they did was they freaking permed her hair <laughs> straight up like the Bride of Frankenstein <laughs> to where it was stiff. I mean, it wasn't flowy at all. I mean, you could have you could have thrown a ball off it. It would have bounced. <laughs> and I'm going, why are they doing this? It was because the average person on the street would have been like, oh, yeah, look, you know, she's in zero G. But it didn't matter which way she turned, lie down, stand up, move. Her hair was just always <laughs> permanent, permanently up. And one of the woman's one of the woman's hair wasn't didn't do well and sort of kind of looked like Medusa's tendrils you know the snaky head thing mm. and it was just it was horrible it was absolutely horrible so now they're kind of cutting everybody's hair short i mean we we were the answer to that we called them on it and it's, but the point was you only do that you only do that sort of production disaster if you can't do it in real life meaning you're faking it because something there's there's a reason there's a there's a big reason why you you can't you can't get up there Basically, that's that's what we're saying. And so you're just simulating everything down here and just telling people they're up there. Keep it militarized until recently with the whole SpaceX thing. And, and which is why the, the SpaceX, if you guys haven't heard about it over in, in the UK yet, the SpaceX thing that, that they're thinking of doing for next year. Oh, my Lord. They're saying they're actually going to fly two people <clears throat> and do a slingshot around the moon. They're not going to land on the moon, but they're going to take people around the moon and back in a SpaceX rocket. And well, they like a holiday. Gonna, yeah, yeah, and there's there there people are paying for this, and they're saying they're going to do this by next year, 2018. Mm. Wow! And I'm going. How are you going to pull this off? Do you know how? Because look, 4K cameras, you can get those in a box of cereal nowadays. They're super cheap. Mm. So there should be 4K. This thing should be filmed from every angle all the time. How are mm. you going to get away with sending people around the room? I'm sorry, around the room. Well, actually, it would be around the room. <laughs> the, around the moon and back and and fake that footage you're, you're going against everything nasa's been trying to hold together for the last 60 years i don't think it's going to happen uh i think they're going to scrub the mission i think they're going to they're going to kick it down the road there's going to be some major malfunction or they'll just blow the rocket up on the pad i don't know one, one of those two things sorry i'm off in the weeds now i forgot what the original question was <laughs> <laughs> well i was i was just listening in actually and just thinking about um uh, Richard Branson, um, who um, is a Virgin Galactic, yeah, yeah. Virgin Galactic thing. I mean, I'd, I I heard about that a while ago. Um, I don't know really what came of it, but I know that Beyonce and Jay Z were going to be the first, um, you know, couple and also mu music, well, well, artists to go up and do a music video 
in yeah. space. It's, uh, I, it's, I don't know if they did that or not. No, 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 they didn't. But... There, it's a can. The, NASA is the quintessential let's kick the can down the road thing and deal with it later. Meaning, um, and I'll compare it to the hydrogen fuel cell cars. If you guys remember those back when you know some years ago bush was president they were saying oh yeah hydrogen fuel cell cars that's going to be the wave of the future not this battery stuff mm -hmm. and but the problem was they they couldn't solve the technology problem even though they, they were getting it and the reason why they were doing hydrogen was the oil companies don't have the monopoly on electricity but they do have the monopoly on producing hydrogen so that's what you know that's what you sell that's what you're going to promote but unfortunately hydrogen fuel cell cars they don't work in cold weather and as you know, there's a lot of cold places on the world. So mm. they, but the point was they kept just kept kicking the can down the road and saying, oh yeah, well, another 15 years, we'll get that hydrogen thing knocked out. Another 15 years, we'll get that. And now it's 2017. The hydrogen fuel cell cars thing is dead, dead and buried. And nobody mm. even talks about it anymore. The point was, is that if you go back 15 years ago, it was absolutely going to happen. So when anyone says that they're going to be, I don't care what film star, movie star, rock star says they're going to the moon, it ain't happening. The Mars program, otherwise known in the United States as the Orion program. Oh mm. my Lord. That thing. You guys want to look up some fun stuff. Look up and it's on the NASA website right now. It's called uh, Orion Trial by Fire. It is a great little seven minute video made by NASA. Won a local Emmy award for, for their production of it. I don't know why. It's all right, but it's not that great where they were talking about the Orion program, which is the American's mission to Mars. And in it, they were talking about the capsule and how they were talking about how the first capsules were going to be unmanned and they were going to test them heading towards the moon because they haven't had figured out how to solve the radiation belt problem yet of Van Allen, the Van mm. Allen belts. And I'm going, and I'm going, whoa, 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 what are you even talking about? I go, when was this video made? The video was made at the end of 2014. I'm going, you solved the Van Allen problem in the 60s because Apollo 8 through Apollo 17 took round trip through the Van Allen belts and nobody died. Nobody got radiation poisoning. Nobody got cancer. So what is, what's the problem? Exactly. That was, mm. that was technology. It was 60 years ago. How is the problem? And that's a question I throw at uh, I, I, anybody I can in the science community because it's a trap because if they say uh, that the Van Allen belts aren't deadly then I say okay then why does NASA think they're deadly and if they say well they're deadly then I say okay how did Apollo get through them you can't win either way um, because if you look at the Apollo program the, the, here's here's the reason why it's a trap question there are only two metals we know currently that'll that'll stop radiation and one is lead the other is gold both are very heavy in fact gold is twice as heavy as lead and yet the shielding when you look at the specs and all the apollo program didn't use anything at all just used a little bit of aluminum which doesn't stop any sort of radiation you go to the dentist's office you get a big you know lead blanket put on you there's a mm. reason for that and you're saying well that's x-rays i'm going what do you think the van allen belts are <laughs> yeah, a whole bunch of, it's a bunch of stuff if you believe in the belts at all that's why i think nasa shot themselves in the foot mm. not to go off on a, on a rant but van allen announced it in 1959 he goes it's super deadly super deadly you can't go through them and, but then kennedy comes along and and says oh yeah we're gonna go to the moon by the end of this decade and then van they're going to van allen immediately going hey dude how are we gonna get past that he's going well you know what we're gonna go real fast seriously that was his answer we're just gonna floor it we're gonna gun it <laughs> and I'm going, I'm going, all right, well, your fastest speed to date was, I don't know, 15,000 miles an hour. You say the belts are about 60,000 miles thick. It's three plus hours each way inside those belts. I may not be uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, but that sounds like a big carcinogenic problem to me. <laughs> Just a little so, bit. So, I, and plus you're going to have to slow down on the way back. Fine, you think you could punch through it on the way out? Fine, I'll give you that. Just just for argument's sake but on the way back it's all about hitting the brakes which means you're spending even a longer time in them on the way back and yet to date no astronaut and there's seven that are still alive even today no astronaut died none got radiation poisoning the capsules are in the smithsonian you could run a geiger counter over them they're not going to click a bit so how'd they get through them and it's because they weren't there in the first place they were they were just made up to stop the American subcontractors from getting involved because you don't want companies like 
oh, I don't know, forget about SpaceX and Virgin Galactic. Those, those are just mm. a couple billionaires. Think of the bigger companies like Lockheed Martin or General Dynamics or Boeing. Those guys, you know, the, the yeah. people that make the parts for NASA, they could have gone and done it. So, sorry, mm. I'm, I, I'm, you caught me on a chat. No. <laughs> it's okay mars is in gemini um you know we're gonna and, and, be and passionately and by, discussing what we want to and by the way yeah astrology i again just because and and i say this to the to the religious side as well because uh, I'll, you know i'll use a biblical thing not not that i could quote too much chapter and verse but i'll say look yeah if you believe god created the the sun and the moon yeah well, fine but it was nasa that told you how big they were and how far they were away Mm. And the, in fact, NASA told you, gave you all the numbers for everything because they had to, or the science in general had to give you all the numbers. Eventually, you know, once the space programs took off, then they, uh, they were the ones that gave you all the detailed numbers. Um, another great thing, again, Stanley Kubrick, not a, uh. Um, uh, not a flat earther, but he was an anti-moon guy. If you, if you've ever seen the documentary Room 237. He was, he was oh, I think I have seen that. Um, and he was, a, he was supposedly the person who actually created yes. the footage wasn't he the, um, sto the story goes yeah. that it's a brilliant a brilliant little story yeah. which is that stanley kubrick was hired because he was turned down when he made dr strange love which is a classic he made dr strange love he asked the united states military if he could use some of their he, he wanted to build a b-52 bomber you know the interior and he was wondering if he could use you know go inside one take some pictures and they go absolutely not that's classified the russians may find out blah 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 and uh, you know, like the russians have ever been our enemies and <laughs> and he goes fine and so he did it just on you know he cut and clipped different pictures that he'd seen in magazines over the years and he made his own interior shots of a b-52 bomber and it was convincing enough that they got a hold of him and the again if you believe the story where he says look they said look you say and there were other other directors that were candidates but they figured okay what can this guy do with a real budget and they said what can you do to simulate space on film and they backed what is now known as probably the the, the finest well-aged sci-fi movie of all time yeah. which is 2001 a space odyssey incredible they, it, and they backed him in five years it took him to make that and he's like, you, and, and he ba is, find me a Hollywood studio that'll let a director take five years to make a movie. You he was know, an absolute he, perfectionist, though, the way that he did it. And without yeah. having the CGI back in those days to do yep. what he did the, to the quality that he did. Oh, it. yeah. Yeah. You watch it on Blu-ray nowadays and it's yeah. still very, very good. I know. Uh, you, you, you can't see. Yeah. Without what you said, without the CGI, what he did. And, and this is in the 60s. Yeah. And. So what happened was, though, like anything, like any romance, it seemed like a great idea at the time. It's like, look, unlimited funding. What director wouldn't go for that? You know, he, like, he had a special lens built by, you know, that they paid for, you know, first of its kind. And he did some amazing, amazing stuff. Plus, he was the leader in front screen technology director and work. And the story goes is that eventually, like anything, you know, Hollywood and, and the government don't necessarily make good bedfellows. He backed mm -hmm. out and said, all right, I'm done. But by that time, they'd already gone pretty far with it. And so he wasn't involved in the last part of it, meaning uh, when they shot, when they actually aired the American Apollo footage, he wasn't anywhere near the place. And mm -hmm. Room 237, cut to the chase here. Room 237, he was so disgusted with the whole thing, but he mm. realized that if he, there's no way, who is he going to tell? You know, he, he would have been clipped, you know, it would have been turned into a, some drug overdose thing. That mm. he built the entire confession into the 1980 movie uh, based on a Stephen King book called The Shining. And mm. it was brilliant. And we're in the, and, and nobody figured it out. Again, that's how brilliant it was. Nobody figured it out until years and years later when it came out on DVD and Blu ray. They were breaking down frame by frame, and the room two three seven was the the room where where all the bad stuff happened in the movie. Yeah, and it was the movie. It was room where nothing was real, right? Mm. And the and if you remember that one scene where Jack Nichols comes in, it was a beautiful woman. It started off as a beautiful woman, but then it turned into this horrible, ugly, you know, thing. Yeah, and room two two three seven is of course two hundred thirty seven thousand miles to the to the moon yeah. and the on the room key it's an anagram for moon room 
Mm, and, yep, uh, yep. I've was... definitely, definitely seen it. I went to um, I went to a cinema and saw a screening. Um, oh, lucky! It was so. It was. I mean, at the time I was watching it, I went with a couple of other people, and they they got bored and left because they sort of. I think they went along because they wanted to tell people that they'd seen this RT film. But there okay. were so many really interesting points that they made in that, like the when the the little boy is actually wearing an Apollo thirteen. Was oh it? no, Paul, Apollo, the Apollo, Apollo eleven shirt. Oh, Apollo the eleven shirt, and he's like moving those. He's like throwing those little like rocks or balls on the floor, and they're saying yeah. like, you know, this is symbolic of. Uh, you know so much and I don't know I just I found a lot of it very interesting um, oh, and, I, uh, I found I men, yeah. you mentioned the sweatshirt I found something with sweatshirt nobody even found not even the, the guys that did the documentary which mm. was it's a little thing but I'm, I'm still taking credit for it which is <laughs> when he gets up right that kid is wearing an Apollo 11 sweatshirt handmade mm. handmade knitted sweatshirt yeah. right or sweat I'm sorry sweater sweater yeah. so what's interesting about that is that kid is only what seven in that film maybe eight i don't know not that old right well yeah. the yeah well it was the the movie was in present day which was in 1980 right but the yeah. apollo 11 that was in 1969 so when did she make the sweater exactly <laughs> did she make it after the fact was she honoring apollo 11 11 years later because it fit him you know it fit the kid perfect it was it was made for him that year in 1980 so mm. why did she make him an Apollo? There was no anniversary in 1980. Mm. Why why did she make him Apollo 11? Unless you unless you say, well, the 10 year anniversary in 1979. It's like, come on, seriously, what mother's gonna make a 10 year anniversary sweater for her her, her child? But yeah, it was a great great movie. And he, Stanley Kubrick, yeah, he and and the part where where his friend died, the uh, the mm. the black innkeeper, uh, yeah. that, that comes back. That represented the one person. Who he told, you know, yeah. it's like who he mentioned to. It's like, oh, by the way, it's fake. By the way, it. it I got. I got. I mentioned this real quick because people say, "Why are you talking about this?" I'll go. Here's why I'm talking about this, because when it comes to the moon missions, it's, it's going to be that's the first thing you have to give up, because the whole flat Earth thing answered a question for me that's been rattling around my head for at least ten years, which was, what? Why would you fake the moon missions? Why? Why would the Americans fake the moon missions? Because I looked at that for a while. It's like everyone knows it was faked. Even the, even a rough skeptic knows the moon missions were faked. But you don't know why. And I kept thinking, it's like, yeah, being an American. I was like, yeah, rah, rah, wave the flag. I guess that's a good answer. I mean, but you're talking about a lot of money just to, you know, to get on a couple, couple of, you know, some magazine covers and, you know, look good for other countries. It wasn't until the flat Earth thing where it finally hit me. It's like, no, no, you didn't. Nobody wanted to fake the moon missions. You had to. You had to fake the moon missions because if you don't go, someone's going to want to go. And, mm. and sooner or later, a corporation is going to go. In fact, why some of the bigger corporations? I mean, Doritos should have a freaking banner on there right now. You know, uh, <laughs> some of the major car companies or oil companies, somebody should be shooting up a massive laser. You know, someone should go there, put a giant laser reflector thing and or a solar powered laser thing that can light up that you can see from 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 the earth and they don't and you're not gonna ever let that happen because you can't get there and that was the point you got to go military you got to go you've got to make it look boring oh, nothing to see here we went like mm -hmm. six or seven times you know unrealistically we went what was it six times in three years or something like that it was ridiculous the amount of times <laughs> they went it's like oh yeah we took a car we we, we took golf clubs we shot a few holes of golf <laughs> Nobody seemed worried at all. The guys were singing and dancing. It's like, really? Because if I was on the moon, if I wasn't freaking out, I'd be checking my oxygen gauges every 10 minutes just to make sure I could get back. Nobody cared about that. They, they seemed absolutely oblivious. Plus, there's all this other stuff. So you had to fake the moon missions. That's the big mm. thing. And which is why, also why, a little side note, the, um, why nobody else went. Because you couldn't let anybody else go because then you'd have to compare their footage to your footage and it has to match up. Yeah. Because people keep forgetting. It's like it was a space race. Remember the whole thing? Space race. Americans, the Russians. Americans, the Russians. It should have been the Americans get there. They put three people, two people on the moon. Then the Russians get there. They put three people. Then we get a moon base. Then they get a moon base. Then Time Magazine runs a story that says the new Cold War is on the moon. That's how it should have gone. But it didn't. The Americans got there and then the Russians for no apparent reason whatsoever, quit. 
<laughs> they just quit. It's like, it's like, I just pack it up. That's it. We're done. Have you ever seen that in any sporting event? It's like a marathon race where the first guy makes is already made it. Eh, I'm not even finishing. Yeah. No, eh, just walk off the course. You know, car race, same thing. Just drive. You know, just stop. We're done. It's like, why? Why? It's a space race. It would have never ended there. And then no other country. 1972, that's two generations. No other country. The Japanese, the Chinese, the Indian, um, the European space agency. Nobody's gone. No, Nobody's even th talked about going. Putting people I saw... I'm 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 going to hand over to Shana in a moment, but um, yeah. I I did see um quite a few years ago now I said possibly six years ago maybe around that time um that there was some mention of um the Japanese um doing some kind of um, moon mission Good. and uh, it was you... uh, sorry go on what, what no no you you're up on this you know I know exactly what you're talking about yeah the, the, and the, the, the um the the air bubble uh, because it was it was clearly filmed underwater but it was like you had to watch this video for you know, five minutes, and the, and the the telltale was this one tiny little air bubble that came out yeah. of this guy's nose, and and it was like, well, that's clearly underwater then. Um, to, <laughs> yeah, that was that. Okay, what you're talking about? There, there were two things. One, the air bubble that was the yeah, it's called also known as the Chinese space bubble. Mm. That that was the Chinese. The Chinese supposedly also, if you if you hadn't heard, I didn't know until last year that they have a little little rover that's supposedly been driving around on the moon for the last three years. I really? Even though they won't go anywhere near the American site, the Sea of Tranquility, you know, the, how what a great opportunity for the Chinese. Go up there, accidentally tip over the American flag, an <laughs> international incident, you know, it is, does this mean war? I mean, it would be a great little thing, but they can't because they don't want any in inconsistencies. They don't want... Mm -hmm. You know, some nerd, it's going to take two seconds. Like, well, wait, you said you left the moon buggy over there. It was 500 yards from the capsule. And the Chinese, the moon buggy, it's only like 100 yards. Well, how did it move? That's all it'd take. And then it'd be game over. The, mm. um, the Japanese also sent a probe around the moon, supposedly in 2007, with HD cameras. Never mm. took pictures of the Sea of Tranquility. Never left the th film running as they're mm. heading back to Earth. Uh, never had the film running as they're going straight towards the moon. The, the camera's running. It's, it's Everyone cuts. Edit galore. Sorry. Mm. No, it's, it's it's interesting, isn't it? It's, it's fascinating. I don't know. Um, you know, I've, I've often looked into the whole Stanley Kubrick, you know, making the, the moon landing video. And I've looked into all these sorts of things. And I've never really come to sort of a solid conclusion about it. And I think we could do a, a whole separate show on Stanley Kubrick purely oh, yeah. just based on all the subtext of his films and the... Oh gosh, there's just so much. But Shana, I just wondered if you had any ideas or comments about the the moon landings or anything else on the flat Earth theory. Well, I think that we we should give our audience an opportunity to kind of absorb the idea that the <laughs> moon landing was fake. And take another short break before we get into a subject that, uh, as long as you are both still raring to go for a little bit longer. Um, one topic I really wanted to touch on was Antarctica. Sure. I can do it. So if we could take uh, just a couple of moments here and take a quick sure. musical break for the audience to let some of that information sink in that we've been going over for the last hour or so and then come back with some Antarctic discussion. Great. Okay. All right, so um, I'm thinking Strange Magic for the second song. I think you should just be the music coordinator. <laughs> who's, who's, who's singing Strange Magic? Electric Light Orchestra. I should have. Uh, oh, of course. Strange Magic. Yeah. I, sh I shouldn't say, but yeah, I know what you mean. We're are still you, recording. Are you good with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, know. I know. That sounds we've good. Got, we've got Mark singing. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just clip no. that in instead. <laughs> No, I'm, I was, a, well, ELO was a little, I was a little young when that came out, but uh, uh, ELO is cool. Well respected here in the States. Yes, definitely. It just, it popped into my head uh, a while ago. So I'm thinking, okay, so if we start with everybody knows and then do strange magic and let people kind of, because there is a lot to digest, but I do feel like we're still on a roll. Stephanie, sure. as long as you are good. I'm so sorry. Just... I just can't help myself. I just like, I just don't know. I'm just enjoying it. So anyway. <laughs> hopefully I'm not freaking you out too much. Oh no, no, it's okay. great. You don't understand how weird my brain is. It's fine. I, I like, uh, you know, 
just completely new ideas and things like that. And I've, like I said, I haven't really looked into the flat Earth thing, but I've looked into the moon landings and oh, all good. sorts of things. Good. So oh, it's yeah. all moon landings. interesting. Moon landings is a piece of crap. I, I, I've always hated the moon landings. Though. I mean, the first time anyone showed me, it's like, look, the shadows don't intersect. I look, I know enough about scientific principles. Like, yep, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Because it always, bu it always bugged me um, how beautiful the pictures were. How yeah. pre pretty iconic those pictures were. Yeah. It's like, that's the mistakes you make, which is like, yeah, let's hire an advertising agency to shoot it, to yeah. shoot the still shots. And it's like, yeah, that's a great idea. But the advertising agencies, they're, they're not scientists. They're going to say, we're going to need a second light over here and we're going to need this. And <laughs> you st it's like, dude, do you have any idea how, you know, but th they bought it back in the sixties. I think they yeah. bought it. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, how long, when you, when you want to come back now? Soon? Um, yeah. I mean, do you need to, do you want to grab a drink nope. or are you, where are you at, Stephanie? I'm okay. I'm good. I mean, I um, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's now 20 to one in the morning over here. <laughs> No. <laughs> I know. I, that's um, why I'm asking. When she when case. she says stop, I'm 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 done. So. Well, um, you know, I guess um, we'll go with this one, and then maybe we'll call it a day at that because I am tired. Um, <laughs> but. And because I'm, you're British, you're so polite. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just I, I. This is the problem with doing this show. I will probably finish and then just lay in bed and not be able to sleep because I'll be buzzing with ideas. That's the problem. I get inspired. So. Um, that's happy. okay. It's, that, there's not a better way to fall asleep, in my opinion. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So um, yeah, let's just go ahead um, and uh, and then I guess wrap it up at the end of this point, uh, this segment, I guess. Okay, and and I know I wouldn't be pushing so much if I if I knew you know, but I know that you don't have to work tomorrow, so <laughs> I don't have work. I'm, exactly. I'm being very greedy right now. Oh like, no, okay. it's fine. Let's just do it. All right. Fantastic. All right. So. And we'll be returning. No, that doesn't make sense. Um, welcome back to the final segment of this THA hijack episode today with Mark Sargent. I'm your host, Shauna Collins, along with my co-host, Stephanie James. We'll be wrapping up a very interesting conversation today about the flat earth theory and some of the elements of uh, conspiracy that go along with it. So Antarctica. Yes. Um, Mark, I know that when the, the first time that we spoke, um, you had mentioned the treaty that had been set up for Antarctica after um, Colonel, no, is it Richard. Colonel or General Byrd? Ad Admiral. Admiral. Okay. So yes, Admiral. I was way off there. That's all but, right. But um, recently we've had a whole slew of people visiting the continent, or at least they have been writing about it in mainstream media. So I'm wondering what's going on from, from your perspective. Are they running kind of the same ruse as the moon landing, or is there really something interesting about to be uncovered there something is going on in antarctica and i don't know what happened in 2016 uh but it really really changed but for the let me give you a quick backstory for people that don't know what i'm talking about in antarctica and fine if you don't believe in flat earth fine if you don't like if you, you think it's all that space program stuff fine you know you can you, you can throw that out the window too but you want to spend some time looking at something in regards to what we're talking about here. Look at Antarctica, the history of Antarctica and the exploration of it. And because that's how I got into it. That's how I started when I, because I was a big hollow earth guy back in the day. And I thought hollow earth, that's a really cool concept. I dug it. I called it the basement club. And I still think mm -hmm. older civilizations, previous versions of us live down there. I think it's one of the protocols. You can't live mm -hmm. on the surface. Only the surface people can live on the surface and you're not allowed to hang out with them. You're supposed to hang out some other place. And I think the basement club is quite comfortable. But when I was looking at Antarctica, it came about by accident because I was looking at a guy named Richard Byrd, the youngest admiral in the United States Navy, probably the greatest living explorer of all time. And in 1926, he flies over the North Pole and supposedly he'll see some sort of entrance and turn into one of those journey of the center of the earth things. And which is fine, but he never went back there. What was weird was they sent him to Antarctica in 1928. And, you know, plane technology still wasn't that great in 28. And they kept him there from 1928 
all the way until his eventual death, which was around 1957. Now, he just kept going from mission to mission to mission, like he was looking for something down in Antarctica. For me, it was no doubt what he was looking for. He was looking for the outer marker, the outer boundary, because it's not like the edge of the world ends, you know, is, is the coastline of Antarctica. It probably goes in thousands of miles inland until you've run into whatever it is, a soft barrier, a frequency, uh, some sort of harmonic thing, electromagnetic, who knows? But the point was, is that from 1928, at least up until World War II, he was flying nonstop missions down there. And then he left to do World War II. In fact, there was only one country that was down there in during World War II. The only country that was down there. Can you guess who it was? Us? No, Nazi Germany. Really? Oh, you know, and, yeah, that makes sense. And, and that <laughs> makes sense. There's there's your Indiana Jones. They, was, they weren't kidding when they did that story. There was a little truth in that movie where the Germans, Nazi Germany, they were looking for anything to win the war. If, if somebody, there's a rumor, it's like, hey, there's a magical box and buried in the snow, they're going for it. And so they were down there during World War II. And they were still there when, that's the rumor anyway, The room when World War II ended. So after Admiral Byrd would, did the signing, for the surrender signing in Pearl Harbor, for, sorry, in Japan, I think it was Tokyo. Uh, for the end of World War II, they sent him and a full-blown carrier fleet down to Antarctica. It was called, uh, called Operation High Jump. Interesting title. And whatever they found down there, uh, it was taken care of. So if they rooted out the Nazis, that's one thing. If the Nazis asked asylum for from the creators of this place, that could be another thing. Don't know. But whatever it was, whatever happened down there in 1946... That was taken care of. That was when Operation High Jump was. Because Admiral Byrd kept doing missions after that. And then 1954, he goes on national television. CBS affiliate. And in fact, you can look this up on TV. Admiral Byrd, it's, a, it's a, actually, the quality is quite good. It was released by the studio itself. Where he goes on a, a show called The Long Jeans Chronoscope. And talks about Antarctica. Talks about the next mission coming up the very next year called Operation Deep Freeze. And how Antarctica is made out of money. It was terms of resources and there's 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 an entire mountain range made out of coal there's minerals there's uranium there's oil and everybody's down there i mean uh, the russians the i'm sorry soviet union at the time uk is down there argentina chile new zealand australia take your pick there everybody's down there and everyone's getting ready to carve this place up and he was a little concerned that there's going to be some in, you know some resource fighting and of course murphy's law because what I figured was, and by 1954, they'd given up. It's like, all right, we can't find the outer marker. Maybe there is no outer marker. We don't know. So let's just make money. And in 1955, he goes back down there and for Operation Deep Freeze. And, of course, there's Murphy's Law. He found it. Whatever it was. Won't say what it was. Only that once that mission was over, everybody got off the ice. Simultaneously. Everybody. The Russians, the UK, every country I just listed, the Americans, they all left. And they started working on what's known as the Antarctic Treaty. And the Antarctic Treaty, which was ratified in 1959, again, same year as the Van Allen radiation belts were announced by NASA. The, um, the treaty basically says that no corporation can go down to Antarctica and set up shop ever. So if Stephanie decided to form her own country and uh, called it, you know, uh, I don't know. James Attica, whatever it is, <laughs> some, some, some cool country, right? And you became an economic power. A piece of paper would be put in front of you and you'd have to sign it. And it, you say, what is this? It's like, well, you guys can't go down to Antarctica. So what are you We have an oil company. We heard some good things about that place. Sorry, you can't go down. Well, how long is this for? Ever. You mean ever, ever. You can, nobody can ever go down there. What do you mean? China. And so, and, and you can't, I can't overstate this. People, the oil companies can do have have the backstage pass to anything. If they want to start fracking in your backyard tomorrow, they can do it. It's only a question of when, you know. It, or I'm sorry, how? Uh, you know, judges, whoever, they're going to grease palms. They do it now. They just give give people a briefcase of money and they just start setting up oil, gas wells wherever they want. And you can, and and yet these same companies, not on, not only can they not set up shop in Antarctica, they're not even allowed to talk about it. That's the weird part. So and nobody's even, I mean, so like you'd think that like China would protest. It's like, well, we, we need the oil and or we need the coal or whatever it is. Nope. Not only you cannot talk about it. If I was the head of British Petroleum, 
I would go to the New York Times or the London Times or whatever, and I'd run a full-page ad every single week saying how great it would be for British Petroleum to go down to Antarctica and set up shop. I'm not even allowed to do that. That's how tight that place is. Uh, it is it is sealed off. Only scientists and government personnel are down there, and it's not many of them. And the reason is is because you can't because you can't let happenstance take effect here. You can't let an oil company because, as you know, oil companies down there they're they're sending a plane. All of a sudden, that plane goes off course. Where does that plane end up? You know, if, what if that plane ends up seeing something that you don't want them to see it? What do you do with that plane? Do you bribe them? Do you take care of them? What do you, what do, you do with this plane? It's, it's, it's more hassle than it's worth. So they finally said, you know what? The money isn't worth it. And that for me was a massive red flag, which was what conspiracy, because there aren't many. In fact, I think there's only one that I know of. What conspiracy is bigger than money? And that was it, which was you... you you can't let uh, the the money isn't worth letting the secret out, and so they just sealed it off forever, and none of the corporations can can go down there. Okay, so that's the backstory. The what happened in 2016 was very interesting, which was it started out with and again I couldn't make this up. It sounds like a weird joke. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio goes to the Pope and he says, seriously, that's the <laughs> opening line. <laughs> a lister Leonardo DiCaprio goes to the Pope in the beginning of 2016 because. You know, those two meet from time to time. No, that's not yeah, true. Yeah, they Even hang if, out, you know. Yeah, they hang out, <laughs> you know, shoot some pool. Some the, um, yeah, have a tattoo done. The, um, <laughs> no, they, um, well, I'm sure it's tasteful, whatever the tattoo is. So, no, he goes there because even in A-list Hollywood, you only get 15 minutes with the Pope and you have to set it up months in advance, right? Even if, even if you are top shelf. And he's there to talk about climate change. But while he was there, and he's, this is on video, he gives him a book and one of the art pieces, in fact, the only art piece they pointed out was a piece by Hieronymus Bosch, who drew a flat enclosed world. And as if that wasn't enough, he even mentions it to him and says, this is back when we thought that the earth was flat. And then he says, and that to me represents the promise of what? Uh... Uh, hope and the future something like that it was the most cryptic thing i've ever seen he's saying this to the pope right there's only one camera on the two and it's point blank range it's going okay shortly after that that pope goes and meets with the oh boy i'm gonna screw this up because i don't know religions that well the orthodox pope out of cuba if you remember this shauna where the first time these two popes have met in like a thousand years literally and that pope right after those two meet, so the Pope flies out to Cuba, meets with this guy, this guy flies to Antarctica for no apparent reason. He's you know, the, the Pope from Cuba, and you'd think, you know, he's lifelong in Cuba. Antarctica is not going to be a fun place for that guy. He goes to Antarctica, gets pictures taken with the penguin, and then, of course, there's some stuff off record, which we don't know about. But he's down there. Then you've got, uh, it wasn't John Glenn, it was uh, Buzz Aldrin? Or was it John Glenn? No, it was... It was was John Glenn? No, it was Buzz Aldrin. Who? No, it was Glenn. It was because Glenn because he ended because, up going to the hospital after that. Yeah, and he's, he, he collapsed. Died. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's dead now. Where John Glenn goes down to Antarctica for no apparent reason, and then that made the 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 news because they had to get him out of there. They had to, of course, he was going to be airlifted, but it was an emergency airlift to get him out of there. And people are going, a lot of people, especially in the conspiracy world, going, why was he down there in the first place? I mean, the guy was what eighty something. So that was really unusual. Um, there was also you're... a Russian. Uh, there was a, a Russian. Um, the priest group of popes. Yeah, or priests, that, no, that yeah. was the, that was the Orthodox, but it was Russian. Sorry, it was it was Russian. Oh, well, yeah, the, the Russians were down there too, and so was um, uh, John Kerry, the Secretary of State. Yes. What was weird was he was down there on election night. He was down in Antarctica during the night that Donald Trump was elected. When you, it's like, wouldn't you want to be like right next to Hillary? Yeah, you know, just in case she actually did get elected. Why are you down in Antarctica of all the places you're going to be? You're um, talking, and it you're was... talking in January 2017. When no, the, no, oh, 20... I see the the election. Yes, sorry, my my bad. Uh, oh, oh, no, it's okay. Uh, but yeah, John Kerry was one of the yeah. last ones to be down there. And then um, uh, Obama supposedly, you know, he supposedly said he was in Chile. I think he took a little puddle jumper from there mm -hmm. and and did an impromptu thing down in Antarctica. The question is, and then there was of course the 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 talk about the, the Russian fleet 
was delivering something down there. It was really a big deal, and it was a, it was a full blown uh, attack group that was delivering some artifact that. Uh, now they said, you know, some people said it was the Ark of Gabriel, and that was the reason why those they that those thousand men died in the stampede. They said, in reality, they didn't die in a stampede. They were hit by this weird lightning that was down there, and and they were moving anyway. The point was, all this stuff was happening in uh, in twenty sixteen, the very beginning of twenty seventeen. And if in Antarctica, and we've been talking about Antarctica for the last year, which is it's a really, really strange place. It is, and if you believe in how things are built, because people, I, I will say this, because a lot of people are, you know, listening, goes, oh, well, no, the water, because again, it, the things we're taught as kids, water is going to fall off the edge. There's nothing to hold the water in. It's like, no, Antarctica is a very unusual place. It is when you get there, the place, the place just screams, go away. You know, when you get close enough, you know, once it drops below 15 degrees in the water, uh, icebergs start forming. Then when you get to the coastline, the coastline is a 200 foot sheer wall of ice, not necessarily Game of Thrones height, but it's still pretty big. <laughs> and then when you get on top of that, if you can get on top of that, it's it slopes up to um, uh, 10, 12,000 feet almost immediately. And it, and it plateaus out that most most of the continent is above safe oxygen range for people. And not to mention the mountain ranges, you know, because we get altitude sickness at about seven thousand feet. Some people do, and the and and there's no there's no indigenous plant life, no animal life, unless you want to count the penguins on the coast. But those aren't aren't going to last you very long. So, it just there it is the perfect natural reinforcement to for people not to explore there, and is and it worked well for thousands of years. Meaning, even if you could, and I, I made jokes about this, even if you were like the king of France in, say, 1500, and you had a map of what the world really looked like, what good is that going to do you? You got wooden ships, you got horses. You're not going to be able to do anything. And so still being I just sorry, have ahead. to say, um, yeah. because you're talking about wooden ships and, uh, you know, having maps uh, of that place. But yes. basically, there is a book actually called Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Have you ever heard of it? I have not heard of it. but You should probably. read it um, because uh, I've, I've looked it up on Amazon, actually. So it's um, called Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, Evidence of Advanced Civilization in the Ice Age. And I bought this book. I can't remember which show I was listening to now, but um, I was listening to um, uh, another radio station and um, they were talking about, um, you know, uh, lost civilizations on Antarctica. And um, they said, that, well, that these maps predate um, some of the earliest maps that we know and hold to be as truth. And yeah. um, they use a completely different longitude and latitude system. Um, you know, it, it predates, you know, the Vikings and all that sort of thing where, you know, we know that they they explored um, by boat, um, but they've not been sure. given credit that they deserve. Um, but these maps um, show um, uh, illustrations of Antarctica being habitable land at some point. Um, sure. And it, it talks about the Ice Age being, um, you know, sort of wiping out perhaps those civilizations. But prior to that, um, you know, it was actually a place where people could live um, quite comfortably. It <clears throat> and wouldn't surprise me either, because mm -hmm. as long as the, the civilization was pre-industrial, you you could pull that off, but your whatever civilization wherever when we're talking about because it's obviously not ours is yeah. is um it, it shortens the lifespan of the civilization because once they get out there, then it's only a matter of time before they discover you know the outer marker. So freezing up that land, freezing up Antarctica mm -hmm. was probably the the better move. Even and I know what maps you're talking about where yeah Antarctica and it also doesn't surprise me that uh, the, the bottom part of South America is so close to Antarctica because mm. I think there was probably a land bridge at some time, at some point leading there when they were, you know, whoever it was, was, was terraforming this place. Wouldn't, right. wouldn't, wouldn't surprise well, me like at a, all. Like a land bridge type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, uh, what's it called? Adams, is it called Adams Bridge, which connects um, India and Sri Lanka? If you think. Uh, I, that's a good one. I, uh -huh. I did not know that. Oh, Google it. It's amazing. Cool. Right yeah. on. So Sorry. anyway, uh, no, it's okay. So that's that's where Antarctica is. I mean, it's it's a really cool, really unusual place that nobody can go to, and nobody can even really talk about it. And up until very recently, because honestly, we're we're told when we're growing up, it's like there's nothing there. You know, why would you go there? Even if you want it, like you, tomorrow could go there. You'd have to spend uh, well pounds. It'd be about ten thousand pounds, I think. Uh, yeah, about ten thousand pounds to to go there and 
when and what are you going to do when you get there? What do you get for that 10,000 pounds? So fine, you're in a raft with a orange suit, you know, to tr- keep yourself from dying and you get mm. pictures taken with penguins. Uh, there's not a lot of return on investment for 10,000 no. pounds. So nobody goes there. I mean, yeah, some people for their bucket list, they, they go there and royalty will go to what they say is the South Pole. And if people still are having a hard time visualizing what I'm talking about, I'm saying that Antarctica is not a continent like Australia. It is a giant continent that just circles around us and all the other continents are just inside. We're just a lake inside of Antarctica. And uh, the if you want a more visual reference of it, again, the Shauna probably already knows this one, is that look up, the, the easiest diagram is to look up the UN flag. You look at the UN flag, mm, yeah. that is what the, what the flat earth looks like, but there's something missing on the UN flag. You know what it is? No. What is it? Antarctica. It's not there. Because nobody owns it. And and I thought that was really unusual. And people are and and again can't overstate this. Everything is owned by somebody. That's the point we are with this with our civilization. If it's Mm. not owned by you, it's owned by the state. If it's not owned by the state, it's owned by the government. Everybody owns every single piece of land except for Antarctica. And that's a whole bunch of land that nobody's laying claim to. What the mm. Americans aren't going to go after this? The Ru- nobody's going to lay claim to Antarctica. Come on, mm. it's like for for science. For science, we're going to take ice samples. I'm going fine. You want ice samples? We can cordon off a thousand mile chunk for you. But the rest of it, really, the entire continent is is off limits to everybody. They can say what they want about the environmental treaties nowadays, but the the treaty was the first treaty was put in place in 1959. Uh, Greenpeace wasn't even formed until the early 1970s. And so environmentalism wasn't even a word. Nobody even, gas mileage wasn't even a word mm. back then. Anyway, so. So uh, I just want to jump in here and, and make a correction. It was Buzz Aldrin that uh, collapsed. Was and Buzz. was He is, he, so he set lived. a record. He was the oldest guy to the South Pole, and this came from uh, Geek Wire. But they also say during last week's trip back to the States, Aldrin learned that Mercury astronaut John Glenn had passed away at the age of 95. Wow. So it was Buzz Aldrin that went to Antarctica, uh, collapsed, you, and man. was in. He was in the hospital in New Zealand for a little while, and he found out that it was John Glenn, who I, I believe uh, segue to SpaceX. Aren't they calling one of their rockets the John Glenn? Yes, they are. In honor of yes, that you're absolutely good one. Yes, you're absolutely right. They are going to name one of the rockets after the late American astronaut. So I think that um, we should probably be wrapping this up. In in the UK now, it is well <laughs> into Friday morning, and um, we have taken a lot of your time, Mark. Thank you so much oh, for sorry. you know Hi. just jumping in off the cuff and and having this conversation with us today. Um, real quick, there was a, a international. Uh, something going on with a flat earth um and i was wondering oh if, yeah I did, you wanted yeah, to discuss that at all or the, at um, least let people know about it not only is there a big community now in europe but for the first time in 500 years well well, well the americans we we try to do things bigger and better anyway i know in europe they're doing a big tour and they kind of tried to do one last year but we're the flat earth international conference is going to be in the united states this fall in raleigh north carolina which is in the middle of the East Coast of the United States. And if you guys want any details for it, it's going to be a lot of speakers. I'm, I'm doing a keynote luncheon uh, thing, and I'm going to do the award show. We're actually doing a Flat Earth Video Award Show. It's not the first year we've done it either. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's going to be the, the second night, which is the last night. We're only running two nights. And if you want all the details for this, you can just go to, it's real simple, FE, as in Flat Earth, FE2017.com. Fantastic. We'll make sure to put that up on the um, the website for our archives when we put up the show. Uh, Stephanie, okay. was there anything else that you wanted to ask or, or mention or discuss with Mark tonight? Well, um, I could I could honestly probably stay up until the sun rises talking about <laughs> the stuff we've been talking about. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I have millions of questions, but maybe we'll just have to have another show sometime. Um, there you go. Why why wait? Don't time. waste the production value. 
yeah exactly <laughs> so mark it's... we can we can count on you to come back and have have more chats with us on absolutely ETA you two, hijack you two were great i i enjoyed it a great deal and yeah you caught me at a great time i was i was just going through videos and i just uploaded something from yesterday and and it, Hey, he's like, hey, can you come on right now? Sure. <laughs> Why not? That's right. No, I, I, I'm sorry you had to stay up so late, uh, Stephanie, but but I, I think it was worthwhile. It's in her head. Shauna, it's in her head right now. Exactly. We got it's her going. <laughs> right. exactly. And again, it, my, my parting shot before you before you sign off is, look, for those of you who are new to this, and this is including Stephanie, look, don't, don't take my word for it. Don't believe a word I said. Uh, do your own research. I put this at the end of most of my videos. Do your own research and ask questions don't um it, it 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 is trust me i mean i banged my head on on a keyboard for nine months trying to get around this and uh, eventually i said you know what i'm gonna go the other way and it was much less resistance and now uh i am I'm speaking at a conference <laughs> so that's good and if they wanted to find your videos, the Flat Earth Clues, and yeah. anything that you've been up to, Mark, where would our listeners find you? Uh, well, I'm going to put the community first because uh, that's what I love to do because there's such a great community. So just go into YouTube, type in Flat Earth, and you'll get a wall of content. If you want to hear my stuff, just type in Flat Earth Clues, and you'll get the video series. Uh, there's a lot of people that mirror my stuff. My, my channel, you don't have to write this down, is Mark K. Sargent, but you'll find me eventually. Uh, my channel is my name, but you'll see Flat Earth Clues in more than one place. And, uh, you know, just take it slow. And uh, the first, the only, only recommendation is don't get so excited that you try sharing this with your family over dinner. Because people <laughs> will choke on their food. They'll yell at you. They'll call up a mental health facility shortly afterwards. Don't do it. Don't do it. Keep it to yourself <laughs> for a while. And then just play it, play it cool. Because the first rule of Flat Earth is... Don't talk about Flat Earth. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> I, mean, I know you want to. I know you want to. But don't do it. Do, I mean, just, just take calm. I know you get super excited, like I get sometimes. But just, you'll know. You'll know when the time's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Our listeners, hopefully you have enjoyed this conversation we've gone a bit over today but until next time take care and we'll leave it at that and and send cookies right mark oh, oh right was i supposed to say that <laughs> send cookies actually i put that now in the description of every um uh, every video yeah no no i, I figure we can probably we'll fade out that last little bit of conversation into the music okay and then it'll be a, a good outro for us stephanie you've you think? Sound An good? An outro. Yeah. Well, you know how how Paul does the music for the outro, and he kind of fades out the, like the music fades in, and and he does mm. like the bye bye. That's, that's radio lingo. For yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really haven't been doing it that long, but Stephanie is brand new to it. She's she did a couple of shows with me, and um, and we were like, hey, let's do something together. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm a complete newbie. <laughs> So it, what, I, I, the show is, I'm sorry, what is it called again? Hijack. Well, we're, we're doing it under THA Talks right now. Oh, it's still under the talks. Okay, got it. It's, but we're actually, yeah, we're going to be doing shows um, for the rest of the year under the THA Network. But okay. Stephanie and I are doing Hijack. Got it. So okay. um, we're actually, That's... Paul did a... a introduction conversation he's going to put up this week so you can take a listen to that and see what we're up to and what you got yourself roped into because we will nice. be calling you again <laughs> we no will. it's to totally cool no that's great that's fantastic uh anything else um no no let's let stephanie get to bed <laughs> thank you wonderful. stephanie it was awesome. thank you nice mark you. oh i had a yeah, great time pleasure. yeah yeah, hopefully I didn't, you know, she's probably going to hang up and go, oh my god. No. My brain's absolutely... You should see the smile on my face right now. I've had the best time. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. I, I, I try to keep it as light as possible and, and try to keep it coherent. I also tried not to do the whole angry conspiracy thing. That's Alex my... Jones does enough of that, so it's fine. Oh, good lord. <laughs> don't get... Well, Seriously. and I have well, to ask I... 
are you still doing the the strange world show is that something that yeah i you... just did i just did episode uh 102 on tuesday so yeah on, on true frequency radio uh they they, they called me up and said how would you like to do your own show i go can i talk about flat earth yes you can okay <laughs> so i've been talking about flat earth for 102 shows on strain on strange world yeah. that's fantastic yeah, <laughs> yeah so exciting. we will we will um go through this well i will go through this i will try to clean it up a little bit for paul and and we can talk to him about how we want to publish probably next week stephanie cool. is that what we're yeah i think so yeah so give us about a week to get it up i'll send you a message or send you a link for it so you can share and cool. uh go from there will do all right thanks mark all right Thank have a good night you bye. too bye-bye <laughs>